Uh, does the LDS Church have a policy? I don't know. Is it the LDS Church's policy that same-sex marriage is considered an act of apostasy for purposes for, for purposes of church discipline? I don't know. Do you have an opinion on whether it should be counted as an act of apostasy? Why not? I don't. I just don't think it's necessary for you to have an opinion on something that doesn't affect you. So, in the Bible, it teaches in 1 Corinthians 5 that if somebody is unrepentantly engaged in sexual morality, that they're to be purged. In, in other words, what does that mean? Uh, in the context of 1 Corinthians 5, it's talking about rejection of religious table fellowship. Okay, so you should kill them. No, not in the, not in the context of 1 Corinthians 5. Well, that's no. what it would mean in the first century. No. If not you cast out somebody for religious apostasy, it invariably would probably mean their death. Like physical death? Yeah, like literally their death, no. because you're casting them out of their community. So in 1 Corinthians 5, what it means is that they're rejected from religious table fellowship. Okay. They're not counted as fellow believers. They're not fellowshiped with as though and, a fellow. What does that mean? It means they're no longer participating as members in good standing who are fellow believers. Aaron, you've, with you've got to be more specific. So, if somebody, what does that mean? I can't come to the building and talk to you guys anymore. No, you I can can't come, pray with you. You're still welcome as a visitor. I can't eat. I can't share food. I can't tithe. What does it mean? You ought not take communion with us. Okay, in, in so I shouldn't eat your food. And you ought not vote as a, a church right, member. And I shouldn't. Right. I shouldn't. I shouldn't give it. Or, or be greeted as a member in good standing. Right. I should be ostracized. There should be some social consequences. Uh, hopefully an open door to come back. But in the context of 1 Corinthians 5, those who, without repentance, engage in sexual morality should not be received as members, as, as, as be fellow believers in good standing. Okay. Pa Paul's language is that that should be, and, and what they're to be purged. what does this have to do with 2024? Well, if, if it's a true restoration and it's bringing the, the ethics of the New Testament back to bear. Is that what you think that's going on here? Well, I think the LDS Church is rejecting that. No, but do you think that's what the LDS Church believes it's doing? Restoring the pattern of the New Testament it's restoring for what? The Every pat practice that they engaged in? At least the general patterns. Because we obviously right? don't, because they don't have those. The, but the idea, though, is that it's restoring the patterns of the original primitive church, According right? According to who is that the pattern? I don't have to quote off, offhand, but... Well, I'm just wondering if... if what does the LDS Church understand a restoration of what to be? In part, a restoration of the patterns of the primitive church authorized According by Jesus. According to who? Where did you get that idea? Oh, I don't have a quote offhand for you. Well, yeah. then, then why do you believe that? Because you're believing something you don't have any reason Because I've been for. talking to Latter-day Saints for a long time. Okay, so random Latter-day yeah. Saints on the street are the ones who set the principles and doctrines of the church? Or does the church do that? So this isn't a criticism. There's a general optimism that the LDS Church is following the precedent of the teachings of the New Testament and is the truest expression of faithfulness to New Testament teaching. So my, my premise is this, if the LDS Church was a faithful, true, healthy church, it would practice church discipline it would also have on those who commit same-sex marriage. Right, and it, would, it, would it would be considered have, an act of apostasy. Right, and it would also have apostles who talk to God and direct specific questions to God in order to receive specific answers as to what's going on in their specific day. Can I set it up as a syllogism for you? Okay. So uh, if the LDS church is a true church, uh -huh. its leadership will, by policy, count the act of same-sex marriage as an act of apostasy. Right. The LDS church does not consider same-sex marriage to be an act of apostasy. Therefore, the LDS church is not I a true church. I reject your second premise. Say again? I reject your second premise. That the, that well, the, we, we do not condone same-sex marriages, the church does. But it does not treat same-sex marriage according... We don't excommunicate them because we recognize right. ignorance. But it does not that's treat... That's called grace. It doesn't, that's called grace. It doesn't treat same-sex marriage... When you recognize marriage, somebody sins in ignorance, that's grace, right? I think we're kind of racing ahead too quick. I don't want no, to talk no, over no, to each other too much. Saying, yeah. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. if, if a, if a same-sex couple shows up to church right. and they sit down in the pew, what are we supposed to do with them, according to you? Are they believers or are they members? They're... Just they're guests. Members, they're there. I don't know. If they're guests, there's just a long road of gentle teaching. Uh -huh. But if they're members that have and already... You don't think we would do that? Oh, I think your disposition would be to be kind and patient. I'm, I'm not... But to tell them to break up and not be married and divorce and stuff. Is that what you would do in your church? We would, as quickly as we could, call them to repentance. And if they didn't, if they continued to attend the church... Then they would not be counted as repentant, and therefore they would not be counted as members in good standing or members at so all. So yeah. would they be still allowed to attend the church and participate? Of course, attend, but not as members. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I, what I'm saying so is how that... how does one get membership in your church? Uh, in part, it would be to go through the membership agreement, covenant, uh, standard of conduct, the state, shared statement of faith. And you guys, you guys keep records of people who are members of your church? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean, the big idea, that, I'm not trying to talk over your or, no, or race no, rhetorically fine. with you, but the idea here is that the LDS Church 
should, if a true church, right. treat same-sex marriage as an act of apostasy. According to who? According to 1 Corinthians 5. Okay, and if that's not the authority for us, what should we do then? Repent and make 1 Corinthians okay, so 5 part of the authority. so why is 1 Corinthians 4, 5 our authority? Because you claim in, the New in Testament. A New Testament restoration church. Because you claim to believe the Bible as far as it is translated. Okay, so in correctly. the New Testament, you're aware they didn't. Let's have just slow down a little scriptures. bit, right? I talk over people too much. I think you're, you're you're an excited conversationalist. I am too. So let's just both intentionally slow down. No, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. So, if we're restoring the first century church, if that's the claim, mm -hmm. who's the authority? You have to scripture? expand. You'll have to expand. If, if I'm in the first century, who's the authority? The Bible. The Word of God. The Bible? Whether written or orally given through apostles. Right, right. So, we have living apostles. So There's the answer to most of your questions. My syllogism still holds, right? It doesn't. If you have living apostles who are true apostles, they will, as a matter of policy, treat same-sex marriage as an act of apostasy. Why would they do that? Because they would be consistent with inspired New Testament teaching. Okay. And if they believe that God has revealed to them to act different than your understanding of 1 Corinthians, right? I think that would be your understanding of 1 Corinthians no, 5 but, no, as but well, that, right? No, but if that's what... If, that's if what, you looked at it, I mean, like, not trying to be insulting, but I think that's a pretty straightforward I, I, reading of 1 no, Corinthians. I don't, I don't have a, an understanding of 1 Corinthians. Paul in 1 Corinthians very straightforwardly condemns homosexuality. Okay, how and he, cons he can he can He even names it, but he, but he, he includes... What do you mean he names it? Uh, there's a famous passage in 1 Corinthians where Paul says that such were some of you. Yeah, and that, Yeah, and I would also... First Corinthians 6. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, Paul's ethic includes a condemnation of homosexuality. According to your understanding of what he's doing. I would say according to classic... You know, that's Latter a very debated passage. According to classic doing. Latter-day Saint understanding. Well, that's fine. Testament. Classic yeah. Latter-day yeah. Saint understanding is irrelevant. I would even say according to the classic prophetic tradition of the LDS Church, they, they've considered the practice of homosexuality to be and so you think the church what a sin that accepts people who are gay they do not consider same-sex marriage to be an act of apostasy for okay, purposes okay. of church discipline okay. i'm basically just quoting from okay, the LDS church fine. newsroom okay if that's the LDS church newsroom, good for you. and if it was a and true church mean? and what if, does that mean if you had living true and what does that mean how um, does that look function it means that you're apostate like in practice what does it look like in the church that we don't consider it you don't remove the membership Right, okay. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, so you do, and you kick them out of your churches and don't let them attend. If they are unrepentant and persistent, absolutely, yeah. Okay. And, and I'm saying that doesn't happen in the LDS church, that okay. their, their membership is retained. They're not, they're not, um, you do, your church isn't saying. Yeah, and they're allowed, to, they're allowed to attend the temple and they're allowed to do everything else that Latter day Saints are allowed to do when they're in an openly it, homosexual relationship. Usually right? just depends. I don't know. I mean, I, you're the one that knows all this stuff. I, don't. I, I would only go so far as to say their church membership is retained. Okay, yeah, so they're still allowed to fellowship with the Saints. As members in good standing. No, they're not members in good standing because would they be able to hold the temple recommend? Their membership would not be removed. Would they be able to hold the temple recommend? I don't know. I, I don't. Right, yeah. So I think that, that might play out differently. You should probably figure that out because I don't know the answer to that question either. Are they allowed to have temple recommend? Do you know? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Are, 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 are homosexual married couples in the church, while allowed to retain their membership, are they allowed to obtain a temple recommend? I'm honestly not sure. Yeah. You should probably figure that out, right? Because that would be the crux of your argument as to whether there's any form of church discipline. Because the church gets to decide what it, how it disciplines its members, right? They should be removed as members. Why? Well, it's the biblical Because Aaron principle. said so. No, because Paul the Apostle said so. In 1 Corinthians 5. Okay, okay. They, they should be purged in some manner. So the everything, everything in the New Testament, you do. To the best of my ability, but not successfully. But your church functions like the New Testament. I think to the best of my ability is even an overstatement. I mean, I try. Because you guys don't have an apostolic body that communes with God and produces answers to modern questions and situations, right? If... Can I answer? Yeah. For real? I would say that we still hold to an apostolic foundation, that Paul treats the apostles of his day as a foundational set of apostles. And I would say that the, the way we treat the deposit given to us of the apostolic foundation of, the, of scriptures given to us by either apostles or close associates of apostles, we treat that as scripture and we try to obey it. But my, my, my counterpoint would be, I don't think Latter-day Saints treat their apostles as foundational apostles. I think Latter-day Saints, in order to call them apostles, have reduced the definition of no, apostle. they're foundational apostles. Well, they're Bruce McConkie or Orson Pratt. They're, they're treated, 
they're treated very uh, disparagingly. Are they? Yes. Uh, Go ahead. You have significant Latter-day Saint apostles who publish widely to millions of people uh -huh. in important works. Right. And then when they die, there's a rejection. It's treated as thorny and thistle. Miracle of Forgiveness by Spencer okay, W. Kimball, yeah. um, by works, works of Orson Pratt, sermons by Brigham Young, prophet. Right. Right. So latter days. What are those books? Which? What are they? There's Adam God's sermon. What are, what are they? What are those books? What, what are they? How do they function in the church, in our culture? How do they function? They have a significant impact. No, but what, what is it? What is it? You'll have to fill in the blank. No, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking. So I read Miracle of Forgiveness as a Latter-day Saint. How am I yeah. supposed to view that text? According to who? According to me as a Latter-day Saint, right? The church is supposed to tell me what to, how to view that, right? It's not just a book I read and come up with my own opinions on, right? How is, he as, a how is he as a Latter-day Saint supposed to view the miracle, miracle right. of forgiveness? Yeah, so that's what According I to my perspective? Well, yes. no, you're, you're supposed to have the correct perspective because you're the one that's advocating against membership in the LDS church. Well, with the miracle of forgiveness. Used, you used the miracle of forgiveness. Yeah. You used whatever the, the, Bruce Armstrong The book is mocked wrote. by Latter-day Saints. Yeah, yeah, because it's got... But if you go to the LDS Church Museum downtown Salt Lake City, it's, it's a, in a showcase uh, depicting how good of a prophet he was. Yeah, we don't burn books. But it's showcased as a as a no, highlight, highlighted it's showcased work. Showcased as a book he wrote. In a positive and favorable way. Okay, what does it say? Does it have like lights I, I pointing to it? Say this is the shit. Um, for a Latter Day Saint, you don't behave in uh, like I, I don't upstanding have to Latter Day Saints. Specifically, yeah, can behave but online your behavior's been very abusive. So. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that a sign saying is this this is the shit, trying to emphasize whatever it is you're saying about the positive light that's supposedly. In the Church History Museum, surrounding the book sold of forgiveness. five million copies, oh. and it, it impacted a whole generation pretty spiritually deeply. Okay, yeah. there's there's people that had very profound spiritual mm -hmm. consequences mm -hmm. for reading that book or having that book sort of enforced on them. Right. So what I, my my larger and point. The church did that. Abs the, the church fed into that. Yeah, yeah. The church did it. Yeah, I mean, the church told everybody to read Miracle of Forgiveness. And literally at General Conference. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They, they recommended Miracle of Forgiveness multiple times okay. from the pulpit of General yeah. Conference. And now what's wrong with it? Right. Well. You, uh, modern Latter-day Saints take great issue with many of the teachings in the and, book. And why would that be? Because they disagree with them. Why would it be? Uh, first of all, because it was a stream of perfectionism. It, it, taught a, it taught a, to be clear, to be modest in my claims, it taught a repentance that leads to forgiveness, which was unrealistic and not sufficiently gracious. Okay. It taught a model of repentance that required... I disagree with that characterization. I've read the book several times. I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Just Pin sure. pinpointing, sure. he taught six steps to repentance, right. Right. and he said one of those steps was successfully and permanently removing even the urge to do said sin right. from your life, such right. that if you continue to have the urge to do it, you are not yet complete with the process right. that right. brought forgiveness. Right. And that's consistent with LDS theology today. Really? Yeah. So, there, well, would on. you say this? Wait, wait, hold on. Wait, there's, a, there's a sinful habit in your life. If there is a sinful habit in your life, you cannot be forgiven for it until you've completely... Con er, uh, no, I'm sorry. Forgiven is not... So we don't have your same paradigm with respect to forgiving. Forgiveness Agreed. is a process of sanctification, where the sin is actually removed. Sanctification is the process of removing the sin. Would you distinguish actually it all? changing the person. Sorry to cut you off. Right. Would you distinguish it all sanctification from forgiveness? I know they're, they're coupled or they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're distinct, but okay, so uh, inseparable in I some sense. I don't know sense, what you guys do in your church. I don't know if you guys have any kind of a, where you help people through repentance. Sure. Okay, so yeah. somebody's got, like I've got a, What's a what's an addiction that people have? Uh, we'll just say coffee. Coffee. Well, um, that's that would he wouldn't. Pornography. Pornography. Yeah. 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 Okay. So somebody says I'm really addicted to porn. Yeah. For some reason I find it titillating or whatever. Yeah. I watch a lot of porn. It's a very and, common problem. Right. Yeah. So I have a problem with that. What would you What would you guys? That's do? an excellent question. And can we just can we just turn debate mode off for just a minute or two on this? I'm not debating. I'm asking a question. Um. I'm not debating. Well, I know there's going to be people watching this, and this is a real-life issue for a lot of people. When someone's addicted to porn, when somebody keeps falling on their face with porn, uh, the solution's very counterintuitive. The solution is firstly to go, go to God with your very imperfect repentance, your very weak faith, and receive the complete and free and immediate gift of forgiveness of all your sins. It's, it's essentially be washed. And then you stop sinning. Well, that you, you hope to, right? But So my, my counsel to a young man or older man who's trapped in porn is to keep going to the cross and, and keep being, First John 1, 9 says, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right. So I would want someone to start. Please forgive us and cleanse us, right? Right. So right. start with the starting point of forgiveness. Right. Namely, I am forgiven. I am completely justified. I'm adopted. I'm accepted. I have the gift of eternal life. I have an, an eternal security. What's I have the gift of the Holy, Holy Ghost. And on that basis of having a, the gift of eternal life and the free forgiveness of sins, right. then from that, fighting the sin of right. lust. So not that I'm hoping to achieve forgiveness well, later no, I'm on. Hoping to, I'm hoping to be fully sanctified. So that the sanctification... Because the, the actual sin itself is destructive, practically. Right. right. But this, so religion for me is all nonsense unless it's practical. The sanctification won't actually happen in earnest if you are not first forgiven. Why? So in the, in the Spencer W. Kimball paradigm in the miracle of forgiveness, right. forgiveness does not come until you've completed the sanctification process on that pattern of sin. So what, what, what good does it do to give somebody a sense of you're forgiven, you're going to keep watching pornography. I don't want to say that to him. No, I'm not going to, that latter part, no. I'm going to say, go and sin no more. Fight with the power you have of having been forgiven and so given the gift of the Holy Spirit. you tell them to use their own power. No, with the power of the Holy Spirit within them, the, the, the power of self-control and, right. the, and the freedom of forgiveness. So the same thing we believe. Sprint forward on the basis of forgiveness. So the same thing we believe. That's not what Spencer Kimball taught. Well, Spencer W. Kimball and that's what some was talking Saints about believe. recidivism, right? Oh, keep coming back. Recalcitrance, right. So, that so, his, so for example, I come yeah. and I join your church, and I'm, I don't know, you guys have some kind of born-again experience or whatever. I, I think a lot of us are silly, but you guys have some kind of a, of a feeling experience, something that drives you to Jesus, right? And then you accept Jesus and you receive some... That born-again experience is typically... Thing, but right? It's always wrapped up in the experience of being forgiven. And usually it's tears and crying and emotions. Right? I don't have a lot of those. But so rooted sure. in the experience of having been forgiven by a holy God. Right, right, right. God. So they feel like they've been forgven, right? They are forgiven. And then they continue yeah. to sin. Well, I mean, Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me right, from this right, body right. of death. Yeah, so so a, a, a drug addict addicted to pornography attends your church. He continues to remain addicted to drugs and pornography. And instead, now he's using the group within the church to borrow money and to steal. If he's repentant, there's going to be a... And he's forgiven of all that. Well, if he's repentant, there's going to be a practical change of life. Right, you know? right. And so there would be something that would occur that's positive. Fruits. That would reflect that he is actually yeah. Yeah. being sanctified. Amen. Right. And I, I, what I would say to young men trapped in porn is the only real long-term authentic... But you, but you see how... Finishing the sentence real quick, sorry. The only real authentic way and the final way to beat the power of lust in your life is to receive the free gift of absolute and immediate forgiveness and justification. Why is that? Because the only that, just, that, just, that doesn't make sense. Because the only way God will save a man is if he does it in a way that we can only boast in him and we can't boast in ourselves. His power is on display, his forgiveness but, is on but, display. But that would be the case either way. I don't sanctify myself. The, the desire to sin doesn't leave me because of my effort. Sure. It leaves me as a consequence of submission to God. In a continual way. Can I can I try to uh, can I try to represent your view as I understand it? Just well, I haven't I haven't explained a view, so I don't know what you'd be. Well, then please uh, explain it more. I, I'm trying to guess what it is, maybe, or I, I'm assuming that it's if I use God, if I employ God's grace. I'm sorry, receive God's grace to be sanctified. I can arrive at a state of forgiveness. No. No. Okay. Okay. A state of sanctification where you're actually clean. Jesus' atonement is has is purposed to cleanse us. Where does forgiveness fall into that uh, process? It's... I mean, Beginning or end or during? So we don't believe in forensic justification, that there's just one time and Jesus steps in front of you and you're forensically justified and renewed, yeah. because that gives people a false sense that they are, that they're fine. And you see that the, the decline, so as a practical matter, what you're saying, you're saying from my religious perspective, telling people they're forgiven first and then change is the way you do it, and that's counterintuitive, right? That's what you said. Essentially, yeah. the only way to finally break the power of sin is to first be forgiven for your sin by free grace. Okay, I disagree with that. And I disagree with that because if I pronounce somebody forgiven and justified and that they are eternally secure in the heavens, what practical motivation is there for them to actually change? Oh, it's a great question. I, I take it genuinely. One is to show gratitude. Well, it is a genuine question. I'm asking. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I receive it positively. I, I think it's a genuine question that a lot of people have. Um, what, in, a, in, a, in essence, what motivation is left if you're already forgiven? Uh, why pursue holiness at that level? One, because, it's because I'm bought with a price. 
because I have an identity in Christ, because he owns me, because... You understand, Aaron, those, those are, I, and I appreciate it, and I'm sorry for cutting you off. Because of gratitude. Yeah, those are all subjective things. Those don't, those don't, as a practical consequence, alleviate somebody from the actual act of being addicted to pornography, right? Your, your religious paradigm is such that you think that being told by a religious or ecclesiastical authority that you have received sufficient forgiveness, that you are now saved in the bosom of Christ, in the mind of the person who doesn't have any understanding of theology. Would you say that most of the members of your church understand theology as well as you do? No, I, not not equally. Yeah, I, they don't. I, I, can, this I can tell you that they don't. This is experienced at a very simple level for Christians. It, it, and it, I think one thing you said was was maybe a good point is is that you said it's subjective, and maybe I overstated the subjective aspect of it. I would say that the only way to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, who alone can bring true sanctification, who alone has the power to change me, the only way to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is to receive justification and forgiveness by faith only. So if I, if I reject the gift of complete forgiveness, I'm rejecting the Holy Spirit. And I, and I disagree with that, that paradigm. But finishing the thought, I can't fight lust successfully and finally without the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the only way to receive that free gift of the Holy Spirit is to receive forgiveness and justification by faith alone. Apologies if I'm repeating. No, no, I, it's just... It's, it's the cart before the horse. It's the proverbial cart before the horse. The order really matters. Would you, you agree know, with you, that? No, you understand that, that that is a problematic theology. Our church is trying to not fall into that trap. That's a trap that you are, you are forgiven. You are assured a place at the right hand of God as a result of your belief in Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. That would, right? be, that would be the framework. Right. right. Now go and sin no more. That's beautiful. But, you're, but remember, as you sin, you're still saved. And you will sin, but you are still saved. It's the premise behind the And it doesn't matter that you're addicted to porn or drugs or whatever. In fact, you will continue to fail and fall into various sins. Travis, but if, when you die, you are still saved. Travis, if I were to tell someone, if I were to tell a believer, you will still sin, I'm not but that's why LDS theology has a, has a hierarchy of degrees of glory. I'm not encouraging that person to sin, and I'm not sort of encouraging them to go down the path of sin. What I'm saying, though, is that in between now and death, as a fallen creature, because my sanctification is not complete, if I, if, I, if I met a new believer, it was hour one, I said, brother, your sins are forgiven, you're adopted, you, you are in Christ, you're united with Christ, you're forgiven, you have eternal life. You are, as it were, raised into the heavens, seated with Christ. You have eternal life. You have eternal security. Now you're going to experience suffering, and you're going to experience sin. But what's the purpose of the suffering? Uh, to make them more like Jesus. But, but as you experience your own fallenness, keep coming back to the cross. Keep revisiting your... What does your, that mean, coming back to the cross? It means you revisit... Uh, you use a non-theological principle for coming back to yeah. the cross. You, you don't say to yourself, I received forgiveness initially by grace, but now I have to receive forgiveness going forward by works or by merit. You go back to the cross in the sense that you, you, you take hold of that same blood, you receive that same atonement again, and you say... Again, you're using theological terms, you're not using not sure. practical application. The, the, pr the, prayer, the prayer looks the same. Right, so you say, Father, because you forgave, because you love me, apply that same love that you gave me day one and completely overlook my sins. Please, please oh Lord, just for free, though I have not yet successfully rooted this bad so habit out of my life. You repent. You continuously repent. You keep coming back yeah, to repentance. repentance. Yeah, you keep repenting. Forgiven completely. Not, not forgiven later when the repentance process okay, is completed. So, so during the period of time between my initial um, born again experience and my subsequent going to the cross in repentance, my status doesn't change. Your legal status. Your legal I, status doesn't change. Can I just give you a quick metaphor? This is a beautiful metaphor. I got two adopted daughters, right? I, I adopted my daughters before I knew what they would be like, all right? I adopted them essentially at birth. Um, they are my daughters, and they didn't go from zero to five to 10% and so forth to my daughters. They went from 0% my daughters to 100% my daughters. They went from not being mine to being mine. When a person is saved, they go from being 0% forgiven to 100% forgiven. Yeah, I would agree with that. They, went, they, go, they, went, they go from being 100% condemned to 0% condemned. They go from being uh, not a child of God to being completely adopted as a child of God. They go from ha not having any eternal life to having 
hundred percent eternal life. So See, I, I, I can't I go. I that, that's not something I. That doesn't. That aspect of it doesn't modulate. So my my daughters, when my daughters uh, do something bad in the household, when my daughters when my, my daughters sin against each other, or sin against me. How old are your daughters? Uh, I don't think it's important for a public video, but oh, I'm just um, I, have a, I have a teenager and then a oh, okay. uh, younger daughter. Okay. Um, but when my daughters sin against me, they don't lose the status of being my adopted daughters. But that, that doesn't work. That's not God. You're not God. It's the analogy the, the New the, Testament uses. I know, uses. but the analogy doesn't work. The analogy does not work because anytime you put God as the parent or the whatever, whatever, everything changes. You cannot analogize it to a human experience. So Because he's God, I can only analogize it. I can't equate it. Right. Okay, okay. you can analogize it, not equate it. Fine. So the problem with that is, is that in LDS theology, we enter into a covenant relationship with God through a specific act that we have been revealed by Christ. So Christ gives us an act. We accept that act as a covenant, mm -hmm. and then we perform, according to the promise, the actions that He commands. Okay? Those commands, those actions, are transformative. And they work in tandem with grace to change the person. That is what, what Spencer W. Kimball was trying to communicate. People didn't understand it. And, and time has changed significantly over the last 40 some odd years since he wrote that book. So the problem with it is, is that- I know it's a different era. Yeah, yeah, and so the problem with it is, is in the 1950s and 60s, the world was very different than it is now. So the church, a church that is led by God, would have to conform to the linguistic and cultural understanding of the people in order to communicate these ideals to them in their own setting. It's the reason why religion is becoming really unpopular across the world. Would it be controversial for me to say that in the late 50s going on into the 80s and 90s, the LDS Church was pretty explicit about the role of earning eternal life and meriting eternal life and proving yourself worthy no, no, of eternal so life? No, no, so the language, see that's the thing, is you're not a Latter-day Saint, you never have been, right? right? So from, a, from having grown up in those eras, I understood what they meant. I understood that they were not telling me to earn because I can't earn. They use that, Again, they use that language so pretty straightforwardly. No, no, right? I, understand, I understand what you're saying. Up until the and 2000s. That's, that's the problem. And so what, what Christians who don't understand what's going on in the church as a practical matter are often putting back on us when they come out here and do this stuff, is they're saying, so-and-so in 1964 said, and so-and-so in 1989 said. But what they're not doing is they're not trying to understand the confluence of language and how language changes over time. Can I, let me, so the reason why I think the LDS Church teaches essentially a merit system. It doesn't it, teach a merit system. I, I would reject that as well. Yeah, what? I, what I, merit, wait, wait, what is the, how do I merit? Uh, can I, let me fill it out a little bit. Okay. I, I don't think that in order to argue the LDS Church is a merit system, it would suffice just to find a singular quote that uses merit. No, 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 not quotes. I'm saying, I, well, I, I don't care what the quotes are. Just filling it out, I, I would say, say... Our theology is merit-based is what you're saying. I, yeah, I would, How do I merit? Uh, I would say there's three lines of evidence I can think of. I'm, this is ad hoc on the street off the cuff, sorry. Um, one is that in the classic Latter-day Saint worldview, I don't want to stereotype you, I don't know where you're at on this, but in the classic Latter-day Saint worldview teachings, historic teachings, God was not always God and progressed unto and what he is true. today. Okay, well, in the... In the, in the that's a really bad reading of the King Falls. It is a mainstream dominant view that was popularized by subsequent it's LDS prophets. It's usually what occurs, so like your God never sinned shtick that you've done for years. So that, that's, that's actually one of the first things that I thought was totally incoherent. Is that, no, that, was, that, was lead, that was interviews with Latter-day Saints. I know, but it was what it was is it was gotchas. So like for example, I, I, I've had a lot of discussions with members of Protestant denominations. And How is that a gotcha? I'm just no, curious. Here. I can play gotcha with them really easy because they don't know anything. They don't understand theology on a deeper level. They have no idea what the biblical cosmology is. They don't understand the biblical text. They don't understand where they came from. They have this very narrow perspective that the Bible literally was crapped out of the heaven by God and landed on a on an altar someday. And I don't think your it. rhetoric represents the best of Latter-day Saints. No, 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 no. So. What I'm saying is is that that rhetoric is what I often have reflected back to me in my Protestant. I think the way you depict but Protestants. But what I'm saying is, is you, yeah. I know that that is not Protestant theology. I don't hold them to that because that's nonsense. So the, the gotcha, well, the gotcha idea. So, well, for example, I, I well, just real quick. Yeah, I had an sorry, I had a, I had a uh, Protestant the other day was reformed, and he said, God literally wrote the Bible. Do you believe God literally wrote the Bible? I don't know what he means by literally. So I, I would say he, I, I went through a whole exercise. He superintended 
the yeah. writing of scripture through human authors. Literally, he says he removed the guy's consciousness, yeah. entered into him, and the person's hand was God's pen. Mm -hmm. Right, that was his understanding. I've talked to Protestants pretty, who say yeah. very much the same thing. Yeah, so but that's not Protestant theology. It's like a dictation view. Yeah, it's not It's not Protestant theology, generally sure. speaking. People no, I, I would agree there's some Protestants that assume a dictation type But view. literally, I tried to get yeah. him out, and I said, look, man, so Paul didn't write it. No, God did through the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Paul didn't is not the author of any of his letters, which is problematic. Where is she? Five minutes. Hannah, can, can you give me a little bit? Five minutes, darling. So... The, the point being is is that that's their view. Hannah, are you okay? Yeah, Is it okay? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so. So the the point being is is that. I saw your God never sent I'm so stick. Sorry. Hey Hannah, are you being be respectful, please? You good? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I gave her a card to buy some sort of ice cream with or something. I think they're on church property. So, um, but the point being is, is that I know that when they're re representing to me things that are not consistent with the established doctrine of Protestantism, I don't hold them to it. No, that. That's what you do. There's a. Can I respond to that? I, I think. I think. The concern of a gotcha is a valid concern. Can I say that? But a, a concern has more to do with minutia and sophistication and conceptual definitions. Right. My, gotchas don't have to do with the basics. So if I if I said something no, like... No, they do. Yeah, so what you're explaining look, in that well, paradigm no, me, is um, not basics. If I were to ask somebody, um, does God sin right now? Right now. Uh, every Christian... Can God sin? You could, yeah, if you asked every Christian, can God, can God sin? sin? Every Christian would say no. Yeah, God, I would say that too. I, I, I agree. Latter day Saints, right. well, it actually depends and on the He never has and he never but, will, and Jesus can't sin. He just can't. Okay, well. How could he? If you were to ask a hundred Protestants, has Heavenly Father perhaps ever sinned? Uh -huh. One hundred of them would say no. Right. The point of my God Never Sin project was if I ask a number of Latter day Saints, was Heavenly Father once perhaps a sinful mortal? prior to his exaltation, They're using their about, and not theology. about one third of them would say no, right. and, a, and a two thirds would either say yes or maybe or probably or we don't know. But can I, can I add on to that? What I think Travis's point is, is that they are doing that in spite of LDS theology, not because of it. Right. So the problem with it is, no, is the way, the way no. you're framing your question is also problematic. So I'm connecting it to Lorenzo Snow couplet theology. Right, which, as which, man is, God once was, as right. God as man may be. Why, right, right, why do you think connect. so many Latter-day Saints are okay because they, with they Heavenly are Father not, having right. been a sinful mortal? Because they're lazy and they don't actually look at what the couplet is. They don't look at our theology. They don't read the scriptures very carefully. The same thing with Protestants. It's why they get Protestant theology wrong all the time. You guys, you guys live in this world of we have the truth and you don't and the reason you don't is because when i talk to members of the church on the street they're not well versed in the deep complexities of our theology just to be clear though the idea that heavenly father might have been a sinful mortal is not about being well versed it is it's about, it actually is it's, it's about actually, having basic christian again, again, you're, beliefs you're and intuitions you're imposing your worldview on us we know what's important for us and that is not important it's whether, not significant. To be clear, whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal. Well, he wasn't in LDS. But theology. whether he was is not important. But believe, is, is that salvific? Yes. Okay. You I, believe I, it's I can tell you why. I mean, we, well, I understand why, because you guys believe it somehow. Let me ask you. God. Why do you think it's not important whether Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal? Well, I don't mortal? believe that he is. But why so. do you think it's not important whether because he was? Because how does that effectuate how somebody has a covenant relationship with Jesus in the manner in which he prescribed? Because the only covenants that matter come from a God who is never sinful. No, no, again, again, right. Did Jesus sin? Does any LDS person ever tell you that Jesus sinned? No. Okay. Does any LDS person tell you that Jesus is the God of the Hebrew Bible? In a manner of speaking, that, yeah. that he's Jehovah, yeah. Yeah. and they don't believe he sinned, Correct. and they're in yeah. a covenant relationship with Christ. I would be very. So your point. I would be is very moved. careful. I would be very careful to make sure people understood. I'm not saying Latter Day Saints teach or believe or speculate that Jesus was ever a sinful. Right, man. right. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, right. you know that, right? But so where the gotcha comes in is you're saying, but above him is our heavenly Father and Lorenzo Snow Couplet and some misstatements from the King Follett sermon and everything else I can find. From from Joseph Smith. Yeah. Joseph Smith misstated them? 
no, no. The king fault sermon. Right. He, s- he, says, in the, he says in the sermon, we have imagined and suppose. So you know what the king fault sermon is? Well, I'll just quote a part of it for the viewers. No, 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 wait. What is the king fault sermon? Tell them all. A, What's general, the king a general conference address okay. that doubled as a funerary, funer- sorry, okay. funeral sermon. And how do we have it today? Uh, an amalgamation of four or five different okay. accounts. Yeah, and so how, did, how do we have it today? What does that mean? It's an amalgamation of four accounts. The church, through its authorized history, performed what was a responsible amalgamation. Okay, and what is it today? I don't know sure what like you're asking. What is, what is its status in the church today? Um, I'm not sure it's what you're asking. It's a canonized revelation? It's, it's not in the standard works. And we understand completely what he meant? Um, of course not. I yeah, right, that. right. Yeah. So, so my problem with it is, is you're taking what to most Latter-day Saints is an obscure passage. Not obscure. It's not. It is. In, the, in the LDS manuals, uh, teachings of the prophet, how does it go? Teachings right, of the prophet and right, Lorenzo right. Snow. They treat it as, they, they basically treat it as revelatory. The, the LDS Church manuals treat, no, treat this. Well, hold, I, I thought I'd love to complete is the LDS Church te- treats the King Fault discourse as one of the most pivotal sermons of history yes, by its founding who prophet. Does, who does that? Who said that? Yeah, uh, I don't have right. an offhand so, source so for it. So nobody, nobody said that. So. It's not an obscure sermon. But what I'm saying is, is that it is important. Smith himself didn't right. treat it like an obscure sermon. Smith himself died six weeks later. But the, way, the, the manner in which he spoke about his own, his own sermon again, elevated again, it to again, utmost again, importance. Again. You don't get to decide what is authoritative for Latter-day Saints. Then decide what is important for our theology. And then dictate back to that to people on the street. That's for the church to do. And you're not doing your homework and actually representing correctly LDS theology consistent with the way that members actually understand it. What you've have, done is, Have you read the document I did on, on this project? I'm very careful. I, I talked about year, like 15 years ago. So I, I'm very careful to say the LDS Church has no official position on whether Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinful mortal. We, we actually don't believe he was. Well, there's, well the we there is is. So where, where does it say is, that we have it, no official or whether he's a sinful mortal? There is no. Because the King Fallot sermon specifically says that he was not. The the, the King Fallot discourse says. The King Fallot discourse specifically states that he was not. Not what? That 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 he was not a sinning, sinful mortal in the way that you represent no, to people no. on the street. Yeah, it's, that's not... No, it actually does. Yeah, let me pull, I feel like we're... It literally does. I feel like we're... No, it literally does. That it's not... It sorry. does not represent the Father of Jesus Christ as ever being a mortal capable of sin. He never indicates that that's even a possibility. In fact, he refutes that idea okay. specifically. Do you, what, what you're not understanding is what is I think we're moving pro- too fast and I'm not smart enough to move, move at this pace. I, I know, and it's, it's so, the idea is is that in the King Follett sermon, he is addressing what principle specifically? Okay, well, can, I, can I distinguish the original text of the sermon as There's reconstructed? No text well, I mean, as, as, as uh, reasonably reconstructed through the amalgamation, there's the Which is why it's not dominant cultural it's reading, right. and then there's the reading as it's been kind of carried through the prophetic tradition, and then there's the common reception of the okay. LDS people of the sermon. So I've done some study on this. And the, One more thing, the sermon in the grove. What you're representing as, as the common reading is the statement that is often abused out of context by opponents to the church reflected back to people who've never read the entire sermon. Which one is that? And not given any context. And that's the one that you'd imagine to suppose that God was God from all eternity. Uh, I'll quote it carefully. We have imagined and supposed that that God God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. It might be an ellipsis here, but God was once a man as we are now, and you have got to learn to be gods. Yourselves, right. Yourselves, the same as all the gods have done before you. And in the context of what? What is the purpose of that sermon? Why, what is he To give hope teaching? for the future? What is he teaching, specifically? You have to fill that out for me. Right, so what he's teaching is on, because it's a funeral sermon, mm-hmm. what would be the most common topic for a funeral sermon? Afterlife, death, resurrection. Hope, resurrection, yeah. So what his purpose is, is he's saying, because prior to that, a year prior to that, we had section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants that clarifies that God has a body of flesh and bone the same as Christ right. does. Right, Okay, so... In that context, Latter-day Saints are not understanding how he obtained to that body. Joseph Smith, in the King Follett sermon, describes that he entered into a mortal experience the same as Jesus Christ did. Can I read that part? And that's literally all he says. And so what you're not doing is you're not working through the sermon with Latter-day Saints that you talk so, to for the purposes of saying, look, here's two opposing readings of the text. Can I Which one do you restate with? maybe the issue that made that satisfactory to you? Within Latter-day Saint thought, there's two different approaches to this text. 
looking yeah, at the right. there, there's 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 looking at the relationship between the parallel between the father and the son, and then the father and us, right? So the the question here there's a BYU professor named Rodney Turner that once spoke to this idea that the, the, uh, he he was speaking to this idea that what does he teach? Um, he's dead now. Um, I don't. I'll look it up. Yeah, Rodney Turner. Um, if you taught math, I wouldn't care what he said. But the, the idea is that there's a parallel between Heavenly Father and his children and their future, and there's a, and there's a parallel between Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. So the, the question is, which of those do you privilege over the other? If you privilege the relationship between Heavenly Father and Jesus, you might have a framework that says, well, we're going to, uh, thank you, we're going to uh, continue a pattern, but not exactly like the pattern of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. It's more analogous. And the other says, no, uh, well, Jesus was God before he entered into a world Right. That, the other view says that so Jesus is more yeah, exceptional. So, yeah, it is exceptional. And that for most who become exalted as gods, they once were sinners. Right. And, and so God's, God's, God's experience would also have been exceptional like Christ's and would right. not have been indicative of an atonement because that was the role of the Son. In either framework, some of the gods that are exalted as gods were once sinners. And the, so, the question is whether our Heavenly Father, we really well, lucked they're out. Not, they're not sinners. They're sanctified. You don't believe that the atonement accomplishes its function. Well, I don't know if you take this view, but some people use because that that's logic. That's why some people view that, that God may have sinned. Right. They believe the sanctification of it. And that's why I don't, because I don't think that God right. would have benefited from an atonement. So, because he was God. He was already God. Rewinding a bit, in the GodNeverSin.com project, I very carefully outline that there are different Latter day Saint approaches to this, and some take the parallel between Heavenly Father and Jesus as sort of the, the privileged parallel, which outstrips the connection between Heavenly Father and His children. So the, as man as God once was, as God as man may be, you can take that as we are becoming gods like Heavenly Father became a god, right? Or you can say, well, Heavenly Father got His body the same way Jesus got His body, as a sinless Savior for a different no, set of worlds. Okay. Well, as, yeah. as, 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 well, because there's, again, theologically, there's different ways in which God could have obtained a physical body as reflected in... You know, Sin, sinlessly or perhaps sinful. No, 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 no. Like, he wouldn't have had to have been born. Adam wasn't born. He could have achieved that kind born. of mere divinity and pre-mortality? No, 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 no. He was, a, he was God before. Which, Heavenly Father? Yeah, the Father and the Son were God before they would have entered into any mortal experience. Because, because of, they had power in themselves to overcome death. They had power to... They had power to stay death independently, and they had power to succumb to death and then reverse the effects of death through the resurrection by us, by raising with a glorified body. Do you take the Osler view that they were always Heavenly Father was always I, God? Or? I discovered Osler after I figured this out, but yes, I would take the Osler view. Yeah, it's not in literary dependence on him, but conceptually, you would agree that he was always God. Yeah. Oh yeah. So he never learned how to become God. No, no you wouldn't learn how to become God. Amen. God leads, but Amen. Jesus learned. You, can you understand why Latter-day Saints? God can, learns. Can you understand why Latter-day? Sorry. Can you understand why Protestants uh, were very concerned that about two-thirds of the Latter-day Saints we meet take the view that Heavenly Father again, but a we God. already agreed that the covenant relationship is with the God of Israel, the God which Israel covenanted with, who is Jesus in the flesh, who we agree never sinned, who is exalted by His Father to the right hand and also makes a covenant relationship with us. So your, your point of, well, God sinned, it doesn't really enter into our framework, and yeah. it's not something your average Latter-day Saint would even really think about. So what you're doing is you're saying, this weird thing that you haven't really thought about that could be a component of your theology, you haven't really truthfully carried it through. Two things. And then you're answering it yeah. independent of our church, our authority, and our theologians. Well, two things. One is I think that for Christians, the question of whether God sinned and the question of whether it's important of whether Heavenly Father was ever a sinful mortal are not a matter of minutia or intellectual sophistication well, for believers. You can decide that for yourself. But I don't it, know. it is an immediate intuition for all Christian believers that it's necessary that God never was a sinner. Right, right, right. But, sec but secondly, but secondly I, I've met Latter-day Saints that say, I was, I was talking to a Latter-day Saint um, two weeks ago over by the Chinese restaurant. And he was talking about how he didn't, he took, explicitly took the view of Blake Osler. He, he did take that view. And he said, Heavenly Father never was a sinful mortal, but even if he was, it wouldn't matter. Yeah, that's, I, and so I what I would tell you is that from a classic Christian, historic Christian point of view, Which it's, I completely think is right, but Christian. we're not merely affirming that God never sinned. We're saying it's absolutely and utterly necessary that God right. never sinned. So from the perspective of what we view as an apostate philosophy, 
God never could have sinned. Can you say it again? So from the perspective of what we view as an apostate philosophy, we've reasoned that you can't believe that. That's fine. That, that what? That you can't believe God may have sinned at one point in time. I don't personally think that that's even remotely possible. Why would that I be think apostate? the revelations are entirely why, why would it be apostate to believe it's necessary oh, no, you that God guys, ever sinned? You guys are apostates. Why, why, would you, why would you consider me an apostate? I'm sorry. Because I'm, you believe in a close canon. Well, let me finish the question. Why, why do you think it's apostate, or at least characteristic of an apostate, to believe that it's necessary that God never sinned? Because anything you reason in consequence of a closed canon is your reasoning. Do you think a closed canon is what gives us that? Yes. So even you if can't you can't understand the Bible because you have a closed canon. The canon was still open in uh, 30 AD, right? Presumably. Both, both of us agree the canon was open 30 AD, right? But believers at, in 30 AD had every reason to believe God well, never was a sinner. They had every reason to believe. They had, they had, to believe, they had no understanding of God the way you do. Hold on. Absolutely not. But they had every reason to believe, even with an open canon, that God never sinned and it was utterly necessary Where that God never sinned. Where does Paul say that? Paul? Paul, Paul, Paul wasn't an apostle in 8030. In where? In 8030. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be. I thought you said 80-30. I'm like, what are you talking about? 80? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you're yeah, talking yeah. about 30 CE. Yeah, I was talking right, about okay. prior to the New Testament. Right, I'm sorry, so, I wasn't trying to throw you off. Right, yeah. so prior to the yeah, prior to the establishment of the New Testament. Right, it, right during, the, during the open canon, they were Jews and they believers they were Jews. already had reasons to authoritatively believe that that is absolutely necessary that's that God never was a That's an argument from silence. Um, well, uh, you're aware that that's an argument from silence. How so? So prior to 30, they were all Mormons. No, it's based on Old Testament scripture. And, and, and no, just basic. No, it's based on your understanding and interpretation of Old Testament scriptures. I, I would absolutely That's reject the, the idea that the Old Testament. So, what did the Israelites the believe? Do you think that the New Testament. What did the sorry, Israelites believe? What did the Israelites believe? I, I, I wasn't processing both. No, it's yeah. fine. I'm sorry. Just listen yeah. again. What did the Israelites believe? That God never sinned and that no, no, it was. No, 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 no. Wait. I don't think a single Israelite no, that, in good standing wait. believed God was a sinner. Okay. What did they believe about God's? They at least believed that the Most High never sinned and absolutely never sinned and Why do you never think could have sinned that? because of who God is, how to no, reveal no, himself. No, 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 that's you reasoning. Where do you explicitly find statements that indicate that that was their understanding? He's holy. He's the most high. And what does that mean? He never learned. Again, again, attributing words and a definition to words that you think means a thing doesn't explicitly indicate what those words mean. Can I just quote some Old Testament scriptures for why you can. I would believe Jew, it, Jew, good, uh, faithful Jews, I would say faithful Jews never believed that God was a sinner, never believed no, that no, God no, could have that's, sinned. That's just, that's a, I mean, that's completely absurd. From that's the no Psalm God's 90 God. verse 2. So From, true Jews believed okay. what I believed. That, that it that's, didn't matter if Heavenly Father was a sinner? No, what I'm saying is, is I don't know that they would have considered such a proposition or thought about it. So if they hadn't thought about it, do you think they would be able to receive revelation about so it? So God sinned. God destroyed the Canaanites. That's not he sin. He commanded murder. That's not murder. Okay, Jesus broke the law of Moses repeatedly. I don't think he no, did. No, he didn't. Right, again, right. that's interpretation. You're interpreting the biblical text in a way that Why do you, your theology. Okay, hold on. The Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 2, from everlasting, I'm going to give you, just give me, let me give you a handful of texts. Again, Aaron, the problem with doing that is that you're giving me a handful of texts that you interpret to mean something that I'm okay. going to disagree with the meaning. Then interpret it for me, okay? Right. No, no, no. I, I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm not going to interpret the text for you because I'm looking at the larger framework of the text, not the specifics. So there, there is a specific context into which these texts were written. What is that? Well, can I give you a handful of texts that would that would help sketch no, out a framework. You can explain the content. I will, I will. I can only do that here. I think faithfully by appealing to some texts. So okay, in Isaiah. So, so do you read much about? Hold on. I'm gonna. I'm gonna finish that. I'm gonna finish that thought out. In Isaiah 40, God says that He was never taught the path of justice. No one ever took took Him by the hand. God never learned. He was never. He was never taught anything. He was never. So that would exclude Jesus. In His deity, right? Absolutely. God never learned. Uh, Again, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I don't want to be no, no, no. Uh, I just want to, competitive I've got, I've got to go. in our no, what I'm saying is, quick like, rate of talking. Your, your way of doing this is predicated on imposition of a theological framework. So That he never so learned? Are, no. That he's incomparable? No, so for example, that he's the first and the last? Jesus, that he's Jesus, the most high? Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. In his humanity. Learned, right. No, no, no. In his humanity is a theological construct. He became based on, flesh. Based on the hypostatic union. John 1. Right, right. No, again, John 1 doesn't say this is the hypostatic union. 
-hmm. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was divine. That's what it says. So what does that mean? Well, it goes on to say it took on flesh. Right, and, and the Word became flesh. Right, he, he was not flesh. And what does that mean? And then he became flesh. And what does that mean? He took a human nature to no, himself. Where does it say that? Well, he grew in grace and knowledge. He suffered. Where does John identify that he took a human nature? He died. Thus indicating a hypostatic union. He died. Yeah, but that doesn't necessitate a hypostatic union. No, no, he union. didn't die. His body died. He His says, physical, mortal Pe body. I think Peter says in Acts, you killed the author of life. Which means what? It means that the one who created all things died. Okay, in what context did he die? with his human nature. Okay, again, that is a theological supposition that you are imposing on the text. Surely you see that, right? I don't think it's imposed. I think it's a reflection of all the text no, put it's, together. It's a, yeah, it's a reflection of you cobbling together passages in order to extrapolate your own theology. A genuine question. So, for example, No, 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 you're, you're racing ahead too quickly. No no no, 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 hold on, hold on. Do you think, what's, what's more plausible, that the Son took a human nature and died according to that human nature, or that Heavenly Father it doesn't matter whether he was a sinful mortal in the past, according to the Old Testament text no, framework. The, the, the appropriate question is not that. That's a theological question that wouldn't even enter into the minds of those who are reading these texts. Faithful Israelites cared again, about whether faith, Heavenly Father was faithful, a sinful no, mortal. No, faithful Israelites. Again, where are you getting that? Faithful Israelites. Who is the faithful Israelite? They believed what God revealed. Okay, who are they? By name? Are you asking them? Yeah, yeah, who are they? The Pharisees? The Pharisees? It's a, it's a rhetorical the question. Pharisees? Like they were characterized as a very ungodly okay, group Sadducees? of people. Okay, Sadducees? Also characterized as the ungodly. Uh, not even really mentioned, right, in the yeah. New Testament? Yeah, so who? The people who took the word of God seriously and believed it. And then and recognized Jesus for who he is because they, they studied like scripture. Like the apostles by, who recognized him for what he is. By faith, and, and, well, not immediately, but right, they, they, they didn't were, have any idea what he was either. G, okay, hold on. In John eight, Jesus says to the to the Pharisees, I think. No, in John eight, the author of John records that Jesus may have said, but go ahead. In John eight, Jesus says, "This is why you cannot receive my word. This is why you cannot hear my word, because you cannot bear what I have to say." I think I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Uh, he, in other words, he goes on to say, "Your father is the devil." Right, talking to the Pharisees. They're, they're depraved, they're rebellious. Again, again. But uh, hold on, did Who's you say devil? John 8? Who's the devil? John 8 did not imply that Jesus Who's the devil? could have been a sinner. Who's the devil? Sure. Too many rhetorical no, no. questions. Who's, been, who's the devil in that context? You're going to have to fill out his rhetorical I, I, I questions. I don't know, I'm asking you. He's the satanic figure of the Bible. Uh, which is who? The one who tempted Eve, the one who is defeated in Where Revelation. Does it say in Genesis that he's the one who tempted who uh, entered into Judas. Where does it say in, the, in Genesis that he's the one who tempted, tempted Eve? This is Genesis three. I don't the think serpent. you're. I don't think you're actually reading the Bible. I think you're reading what you think the Bible says, and you're walking away with passages that you think support what you think they say, but you're not actually studying the biblical text. Just to be clear: the serpent and Satan to you are not no, plausibly I, linked. No, no, no. I believe that because I have a means by which I would have obtained that information, modern revelation. Where did you get that idea? That Satan and the serpent. But the serpent in Genesis is, is Hasatan in Job. Well, in the book of Revelation, if I remember correctly, this is an on the street, off the cuff kind of ad hoc answer, but the they're, they're linked serpent. pretty, they're, they're linked. Okay, so he says the serpent in Genesis is Satan. I don't have, I don't have a scholarly off the answer for you. He okay. doesn't say that, so I'll just but to be, to be clear, you, in your view, a faithful not, reading... Not my view. Yeah, not my view. Your in position. Your view. Your, I'm not trying to be... Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not trying to be cute here. I'm not no, trying to be... No, I'm not either. I'm not trying to pull one on you. I'm just trying to accurately represent your position. In your position, as I understand it, a faithful reading of the Old Testament would not necessitate that Heavenly Father was necessarily never a sinner. I don't know where, what passage you would cite to that specifically would articulate that. Passage. May I please just give you a few passages? Okay, give me a passage that specifically says, in a pre-mortal existent life, God, our Father, was not a sinner. Would you please allow me just 45 seconds to give you some passages? Well, uninterrupted for 30 to 45 seconds. Isaiah 40 says that God is incomparable, that he never learned. Isaiah 43, wait, wait, hold on, un uninterrupted for just 30 to 45, and I'll hand it off back to you, okay? Aaron, that's not... Okay, just 30 to 45 seconds. Wait, but you're not doing what you said. What is the passage 
where does it say that specifically? Not Aaron's interpretation of it. Where does it specifically say that? Because of, uh, Can I make a case for you? Just yeah, make a case for 30 that. to 45 God seconds. God never sinned. A passage, uh, uh, some prophetic writer or author of some text that said, while God was yet in his mortal condition, he never sinned. Can I give you a theological case from a set of texts? Okay. Uninterrupted for just one minute. Fair? No, you would have to give me one text. Can I give you, can I have a one minute uninterrupted and then hand the baton after you? You can give me a you. text from an author who explains that. One, one specific text that I, you can't I would like a minute. From a variety I of would like to connect some texts. Uh, you can't. I'm not going to let you do that because you can't. That is, that is cobbling together authors to arrive at a conclusion that no one author reaches. That's a problem. That's, that's the problem with the let way me, you Let me give you four or five texts and then you, give, you under, help me understand how you would think of them. Is that fair? There should be one that says it. Can I? Would you agree with me? No, I don't think because theology that works mean, that, that way. Because that would mean no one audience for any of these texts understands what you do. There's an LDS position called divine investiture. And what does that mean? Have you heard of it? I'm not, no, try, I'm no, not trying to gotcha. No. It's a view that Jesus is a plenipotentiary, that he acts in the stead of the Father and represents the Father. Uh -huh. So there, that is not necessarily proof texted. We it's, don't rely on the Bible alone though, because we don't believe in Saul's return. Slow down. But the idea though is that even within Latter-day Saint theology, not every doctrine is the result of a singular proof text. It wouldn't need to be because we, right. we don't adhere to the doctrine of souls. Well, even if, even if you expanded your view of scripture to included texts that are beyond the Bible. No, 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 we don't. The, the theology is not no, no, accomplished again, by again, Aaron, let me explain proof texting from singular texts. Let me tell you what the Bible is. The Bible is a collection of texts written anciently, largely by unknown authors. So mm -hmm. that's what it is, right? So if you're saying it says something, right, it would mean that one audience would have to have understood that without relying on a subsequent author or a prior author in their context. It's the reason why the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, isn't found anywhere in the Bible. So the scriptura can't be found anywhere in the Bible because the ideas that Protestants rely upon are predicated on assuming a closed and completed canon that we can then go through in kind of a course study and pull passages out to yeah. support a proposition. Would you re agree that theology ideally is mutually reinforcing, meaning that the different parts of a theological framework are coherent and uh, mutually supportive? No. That would presuppose a univocality, no, which we don't exactly. I, well, the, I, I would hope that it's non-controversial. No, no, is that my, I, I don't mean that to be Like Isaiah as a could gotcha. say something that Paul could say, that's crap and it doesn't make sense. Okay, okay. let's let's just say you have a, a view of a, the fallibility of scripture. Of course I do. As you're doing theology. Because humans wrote it, yeah. I'm gonna ask you as just a matter of personal decorum, yeah. to slow down and let us complete our thoughts. Okay. I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you in a way no, that's fine. not allowing you to do that, but I think that we're gonna have a more productive discussion if we have more extended thought here, okay? okay? Yeah. I'm, this is not a gotcha statement. That's called condescending, by the way. I, I hope it's not. I keep getting accused of condescending. That's condescending. But I think you've been, uh, it's not no, easy I've to talk to you. I've been me, I know, and it's not easy to talk to you. I don't mean this to be controversial. No, no, I, mean no. I, I get that. Even if, you can just talk. You can just say, give me a second. I'll give you a talk. I don't need a lecture. Go ahead. In Latter-day Saint theology, even if you're presupposing a fallible text, the idea of... I'm not presupposing a fallible text. Uh, here's the thought. If you're... If you're constructing a theology, I don't mean that negatively, I think if you're developing a theology, the idea is that your view of God, your view of the afterlife, and your view of salvation connect with each other. That the, that the dots connect. Presumably, but, yes. Yeah, in, in, a systematic theology, in a systematic theology, the hope or the ideal is yeah. that the different parts, the different dots, right. con connect in a mutually reinforcing and coherent and mutually supportive way. Presumably. Right? So your doctrine of God affects your doctrine of Scripture, and your doctrine of scripture connects with your view of salvation. Is that, is that fair? I'm not trying to be controversial there. No, because my doctrine of scripture is simply that scripture is ancient documents written by people and I read their writings and I rely on God to do something with them in my life. Okay. They don't have to be coherent. They don't have to be consistent with one another. Because I think God uses broken and flawed things to accomplish whatever his purposes are. So the point is, is that the Bible is fallible. It is flawed. It you would say that be. about all Latter-day Saint it, scripture. Yes, right? of course. Absolutely. And you would say that about all Latter-day Saint sermons. Yes, absolutely. For and all just, humans. All first and presidency all, statements. Yeah, all yeah, temple yeah, sermons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All flawed. All, that's why we're amending the temple endowment ceremony. 
Right. Because we learn line upon line, precept upon precept. You guys don't. 2,000 years ago, you decided God stopped speaking, and now we can just interpret what he said 2,000 years removed from that historical context. And he doesn't speak Greek or read it, do you? Uh, I've worked semesters, but I have to relearn it over and okay. over and over. Hebrew? So not a lick of Hebrew. Yeah, so you guys can't even read these texts. Certainly, I've asked you several times, what's their cultural historical context? Because, for example, if you take Paul, mm -hmm. was Paul teaching the Trinity to any congregation? Not in the conceptually developed way. Not at all. I would say, oh, I, I would say he was. Though. Okay, so yeah. in, in the context... He, he treated Jesus as having the same names. No, 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 that's you well, reading the Trinity into what as, he said. Sorry, let me correct that thought. The, the, the things that are only true of God, Paul treated as true of Jesus. So? That's because they're one. He, he treated them as distinct, inseparable, and yet God. Because they're one. But that doesn't necessarily That's not the Trinity. Trinity. It, it excludes okay. quite me, a bit of theology. Let me give you a little understanding. Okay. It excludes modalism. Let me help you a little bit. It excludes no, no, no. polytheism. Me, that, right, yeah. So Tertullian did a good job excluding modalism. So let's say this. I'm Paul. He's a, a Gentile. Pagan believes in lots of gods. The pagan, that, right? the pagan is known as Zachary Wright. His gods... Are they one? No. No. Okay. They're not. But how many of them are there? I don't know. A lot. Right. Paul says, God our Father and His Son Jesus Christ. Yeah. How many gods are there? One. Okay. But in the mind of Zachary, how but, many But are the there? oneness of a social plurality does not hold a candle to the oneness of the Father and the Son. According to what text does he exclude the idea that there are because, numerically Because two? the unity of the Father and the Son is a no, unity... where did Paul explain it? Well, only God can create, and Jesus created everything created. No, no, where does Paul explain it? When you, I, it sounds like you want, a, you want a singular proof text. No, no, that, I, no, what I want is I want the clarity that he thinks exists and you think exists that doesn't actually exist. Can I give you a one-minute explanation? If it doesn't require you to dance around and proof text. Well, uh, you can decide whether I am. You can I articulate a doc doctrine out of one chapter from one author. Sure. Uh, names, attributes, works, and worship. Those are that. That's the framework. There are names only appropriate to God. Attributes only. According to who? Only appropriate. Let me finish the thought. Attributes only appropriate to God. Works that only can be done by God, and worship that's only appropriate to God. Okay, and I disagree with and all the, of those. And, the, and the way that the New Testament speaks of Jesus is that it attributes to him names and attributes and works like creation and then worship that you only should give to God. And you're aware that that's a presuppositional circular theology, right? No. Surely you I'm, believe... I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I've decided that God can only do certain things. Only God can do certain things. And because Jesus also does them, he is... Homo uses with the Father. Can you just dial the combativeness down just I'm not three, or three or four notches? No, I, 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 actually, I, I actually can't. Okay, well. So I can't. I'm not being combative. I'm not angry at all. It seems like I am, but I, I'm not. It's I, more productive when there's a bit. I, I know what adrenaline is like. and Aaron, uh, you don't think this is going to be productive, do you? I actually do, in no, some sense. No, it's not going to be yeah. productive. Because yeah. the problem with it is, is that, again, you, you've demonstrated why. Everything requires a, a proof texting. Of verses. When you say proof texting, what do you mean? You're going to go through a, a series of verses to support some theological position or doctrine that you hold. If it's a series and it's developing a theme, it's not necessarily proof texting. It is proof texting. What, I mean, because, I'm asking you, what do you think no, proof texting what, what is? No, what it would require is it would require you to articulate a theological position from one author. From one author? One text? One author. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think any doctrine of the Bible is Again, dependent the, on the Bible doesn't have doctrines because the Bible is a collection of texts. It okay. doesn't have one doctrine or a doctrine of the Bible. You can agree on that, right? No, I think there's a singular doctrine that again, results. Again, again, based on what? Can I explain it? Sure. So uh, what I was trying to kind of lay the groundwork earlier for was that in a th theological system, you hope to have the dots connecting, the ideas mutually reinforcing. Um, with the Bible having a singular divine author, it doesn't. Okay, we hold that scripture interprets scripture. Okay, but it doesn't okay. have a singular divine author. So when I, I'll give you a really clear example. Okay. In Genesis 3, I think it's 15, forgive me, I don't know the exact reference. God promises that the serpent, that the offspring would crush the, the head of the serpent, Meaning right? What? What's that? Meaning what? Well, 
we learn later that this is Jesus, that the offspring, the Messiah, this, there's, a, there's a continuous hope in the Old Testament that there's going to be an offspring someday, and there's this developed promise, a kind of stacking of covenant promises, that this is going to be someone who blesses all the nations through Abraham, he's going to follow in the line of David, he's going to be born of a virgin, he's going to be a suffering servant, he's going to be of the ancient of days. So when Jesus arrives, we look back and we read Genesis 3.15 and we say, wow, with the, the cross behind us and with the Holy Spirit in us, we now can go back to the Old Testament, some total look at scripture and say, the offspring that God had in mind that Moses didn't necessarily see with clarity, but that God saw with clarity, the, the, the object of Genesis 3.15 is Jesus. So I'm in, letting scripture interpreting scripture mm-hmm. precisely because precisely because there's a singular divine author. Let me so. finish with that one more thing is that I can only really hold to there being a singular divine voice in scripture if I hold to monotheism. Um, it, 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 monotheism makes that belief at least more natural. If I'm a poly, if I'm a polytheist, it's going to be more, much less natural to have that. The Israelites were. In what sense? They believed in other gods. Meaning? In case, many cases, worship. They were not strictly monotheistic. That's why they were exiled. They were not strictly monotheistic ever. That's why they were. The first commandment is, "Thou shalt have no other gods before me." They were rebellious people, right? That they broke a covenant with their God does not negate that they believed in and recognized the existence of deities that controlled and occupied other lands. When you say deities, do you mean most high gods who never learned? I mean gods. Again, yeah. again, you're imposing that theological position on them and right. believing that it's correct because of words like holy and he doesn't learn. That's what you think. That's, well, again, your, your, your theological framework is not based in it, reality. It's, it's, not a, in it's not a win for Mormonism that you find other I'm beings. I'm not trying to win Mormonism. Sure. I'm I, to but, but the, the thought is to find other beings called gods in the Old Testament is not a win for polytheism. It's not a win for polytheism. Because it's just an identifiable reality of those people. The kind of monotheism. It's a really important thought. Let me finish out. The really important thought here, the kind of monotheism that Judeo-Christianity affirms is that there's only, let me finish the thought, there's only one most high being who is incomparable, never learned, is the first and the last. There's none beside him, none before him, none after him. One final thought, the end of Romans 11, Paul says, who has ever known the mind of the Lord or who has ever been his counselor? Who has ever given God a gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Meaning this, in Paul's theology, there's only one God who never had a tutor. There's only one God who is absolutely inscrutable. There's only one God from whom all things, through whom all things, and to whom all things are. And there's only one God to whom is owed all glory. You can't say that about which any other God. Jesus. It, which is Jesus. Yeah. Literally in the, in the chapter 9, two, ver, two chapters earlier, again, he, again. He, he treats Jesus again. as God himself. Again, that's the problem. You are, you are so fueled by a presuppositional lens, you can't put yourself in the first century as the audience of Paul. You can't do it. You are burdened by 500 years of Protestant theology that you are reading back into texts that don't support it. Even even the history of Christianity doesn't support modern Protestant positions. Do you think here's heavenly, the problem. So sorry. here's the problem. Yeah. With respect to your idea of Jesus crushing the head of the serpent, okay, that could be articulated by a later author, but again, the point would be proven and articulated by an author who is relying on an older text and describing it in some way. Again, th- these can't be positions where the Galatians and the Romans and the Ephesians and all these different congregations throughout the Christian world are reliant on knowing I have to have Genesis through Malachi and I have to have Matthew through Revelation in order to understand God's word. I don't. I, I'm not. That's literally what your position would uh, have it, to be. Is it your understanding that we yes. need the New Testament to explicitly no. interpret three, Genesis 3.15 or some future revelation? Yeah. It's, if you're, if you're going to say the serpent is Satan, yes. Because there's nowhere in the biblical, in the whole is, Hebrew Bible, is the offspring the serpent is, as Satan. Is the offspring Jesus? Is the offspring of what? Genesis 3.15. Where does it identify as Jesus? Where does anybody identify Jesus in the Hebrew Bible? 
do you think sum total from the Bible uh, again, Aaron, it's, that you can include again, that the offspring please, is Jesus? Please. You guys claim the Bible is clear and we just don't get it. But On monotheism, right. yeah. That no. God never was a sinner absolutely ne by necessity. What you don't yeah. do is you don't yeah. understand the text in their very historical context. You don't teach it to your people. You don't understand it yourselves. What you do is you cobble together meaning out of a series of texts that no one group had. And then you say, well, they should have understood it by, by doing a survey of, of Genesis to Revelation. Nobody would have had that. The only thing that is consistent in the biblical text is the fact that God called a leader to identify and articulate to the people what they should believe and what they should do. There's no and largely that was done orally. Can I ask you? Not in writing. Do you think there's any consistent uh, view of who God is in the Old Testament? No, there's not. In no. the New Testament? You have no. You have to. You in Latter-day Saint scripture. Right. You have to rely on a subsequent revelator which we would call a seer, to understand those texts. Do you think that your prophets have given a consistent picture of who God is? Yes. Adam God? Well, I, I don't think that's doctrine. I don't think that he's speaking doctrine. So when you say the Latter-day Saint prophets have given a consistent view of God, you're only referring to its canon, or? No, no, no. So in, in what sense is it inconsistent? Well, you've already said so that- Adam that, God, right, Adam that, God. You've already said Latter-day Saint scripture does not Adam God is consistent with what? Hold on a second. You've already said Latter-day Saint scripture doesn't give us a consistent view of who God is. What is Adam God? The teaching that the one who impregnated Mary, no. the one the teaching that our, the, our father yeah. in heaven is yeah. Adam himself. The, the idea that Adam brought one of his wives who was heavenly mother. Okay, okay, all right. So what's wrong with that doctrine? Well, your leaders condemn it, right? right. Spencer Kimball called it a false yeah, doctrine. subsequently reject that idea. Yeah. Right. And it was poorly developed. It was false doctrine. It's not false doctrine, it's not understood doctrine. And the scholarship on this is robust. So what you're doing is you're asking, again, it's the gotcha question. You're oh, asking no, no. a- you're, I think you're out of touch okay, with what your no, own no, scholars no, teach no, on what this. You're, what you're, what, not. <laughs> so what you're out of touch with is you pull things, episodes, and you spit them out, and people on the street don't know what you're talking about. And you don't either. Did Adam come to the Garden of Eden with a resurrected body? No. That's what Brigham taught. Okay. So what? Was Adam the father of our spirits? Did President Nelson teach that? But Brigham taught it. Did President Nelson teach no, that? No, your claim was that we no, don't no, understand no. it. Did President Nelson teach that? Of course not. Right. Okay. So did the author of Genesis teach that? Hold on. No, 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 no. Brigham taught Adam. No, did the author Adam, of Genesis No, you're moving on from no, this no, no. as fast as you no, can. No, I'm saying, No, I'm not moving on. Yes, you I'm are. I'm not moving on from it. The, 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 the prior question I asked you was, have, have, has scripture, has the Bible or LDS scripture, well, the Bible's not consistent, no. has LDS scripture, expansively speaking, given a consistent picture of who God is? You said no. Yeah. I asked, it, have LDS prophets given a consistent picture of who God is? And you said yeah. yes. And then we, but and then, then there was, then, then, then you, you negotiated that really no, no, quickly. No. Then you identified a doctrine in cultural context that was not accepted. So you tell me how, or by in, the, in what sense have LDS prophets given us a consistent view of God is? How is authoritative revelation determined in the LDS church? I'm asking you, no, I'm asking how have LDS prophets given us a consistent view of who God is? You said yes. Because they have universally across time since Joseph Smith taught a consistent message. Uh, namely, okay, again. so Brigham, Brigham Young agreed with your view uh, that no, Kevin- No, 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 no. Brigham Young had a very different again, view than Orson Pratt. Again, how is doctrine in the church authoritatively determined? That's a separate question. It's not a separate question. So in Bruce R. McConkie, Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, Brigham Young have their own ideas about stuff as mortals. So when I ask you... thinking is you're thinking that when somebody is the president of the church, they have to speak infallibly, and that's not so, true. So the question and for no you is... And no Latter-day Saint believes I, that. I, I, I genuinely want to know. And when he taught, which he taught abundantly, he taught consistently, and the LDS members understood him consistently. In what sense have Latter-day Saints taught... Sorry, in what sense have Latter-day Saint prophets taught a consistent view of God? You, you affirmed that. So in what sense is that true? We have a Father and a Son and the Holy Ghost. They've taught more than that, though. And eternally God. They've taught that he wasn't always, that was not Brigham Young's view. Okay, again, your nuanced understanding of specific documents 
isn't relevant to how Latter-day Saints well, understand then teach and me interact what, with their leaders. What documents Again, are you are you thinking about when you say Latter-day Saint prophets have had a consistent view of God? What sources are you thinking about? All of it. They're public sermons. Yeah. All of it. So you think in the public sermons of Latter-day Saint prophets, they've got a consistent view of who God is? No, 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 not the public sermons. Again. I, I'm asking you, what, in what sources or what? Okay, again, that's why I'm asking you, how do Latter-day Saints determine whether or not something is authoritative? They have terms? different models of authoritativeness. What, what's, the, what's the model of authoritative? There's different. What did Joseph Smith teach? Can I, can I give you a thought on this? No, there, you can give me the doctrine. There's different views within Latter-day Saint theology of what constitutes officiality. Can you just let me complete a thought? Like, so there's there's a there's if a view that your thought is going to build, and that's why I keep cutting you off. If your thought's going to be built on a faulty premise, no, because that's not consistent. That's Latter Day Saints have different attitudes about officiality. Would you say that? That Latter Day Saints have different attitudes about stuff we already addressed over an hour ago, because just like Protestants, lots of people just don't understand their doctrine. Latter Day Saint prophets have different have had different views of officiality. Of Latter Day Saints, Latter Day Saint prophets have had different perspectives yeah. on lots of things, but that doesn't make them authoritatively binding on the church okay. or mean that the LDS members understood it that way. So help me out. In what sense do you think Latter Day Saint prophets have taught a consistent view of who God is? I just said. Help me out. Maybe I didn't process it. Okay. Repeat it for me. We believe that the Father reads section one thirty verse twenty two. Yeah. So they've always taught that Heavenly Father didn't become a father. That he was always Heavenly Father and never had to become a Heavenly Father. Yes. That that didn't happen upon spirit birth of the first spirit child. I'm sorry. You know that we don't believe in Creatio Ex Nihilo, right? Right. Okay, but so not why are you proposing a question that's absurd in light of because, that understanding? Can I give you a 30 second answer? Sure. Um, there are different Latter-day Saint views on premortality, affirming or disaffirming spirit birth. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And if you hold to spirit birth, there's a sense, a sense in which sons become sons and the father became a father at the first spirit birth. Yeah, and how does that work? That's, that would be a, a question for the Latter-day Saints. Yeah, right. Okay. And right. I'm not going to tell you. Okay. Well, so, here's the problem with that. And, and again, I get this a lot. You guys believe Jesus is a created being because they confuse us with Jehovah's Witnesses and, like you, they believe that God had sex with a spiritual wife in a pre-mortal existence and created Jesus out of Some Latter-day Saints hold to that. That is not LDS theology, and that's the problem. Some Protestants hold to all kinds of nonsense. Most of the time when I ask them to, ex to explain the Trinity, it's modalism. They use a modalistic framework because that's how they understand it. Usually. Yeah, it's mostly that. And so the problem with it is, is that you're saying, because this guy who I talked on the street didn't understand it that way, that's not how Latter-day Saints no, understand I, it. No, this would not I'm be asking a, based on a singular person. You know the church rejects the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo. Sure. So does that mean Jesus could be a being that was created? Can I give you a 30 second answer? Sure. So I would not say that LDS culture or doctrine or institutional manuals or history teaches that Jesus was created out of nothing. But what I would say is that one of the key claims that Arius made in Arianism, <clears throat> that there was a time when the sun was not. Is there a sense, uh, is there a sense in which that is true in Latter-day Saint theology? I would say in two minor ways. One is, by minor I mean, some Latter-day Saints hold to Brigham Young's view that you had your genuine uh, beginning at spirit conception and that you're not an eternal intelligence. Well, what does that mean? It means, some it, it means that there was a time when you were not, there was a time when Jesus was okay, not. Okay. And, and, and hold on, and the second view is that even if you believe that you're an eternal intelligence and you had your spirit birth, gave you your spirit body, there still was a time even in that framework where the sun was not yet the sun. That's absolutely That's true. true. In that framework, it is. I, you might have a different framework, but... Yeah, it, I, I have a correct framework. In what sense was the but sun eternally the sun prior to his spirit birth? What does spirit mean? Spirit conception, if you what will. What does spirit conception mean? It means Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. How did Joseph Smith describe that? He didn't. That was developed right. by Brigham Young right. further. So, what is the, the, the conditional difference between intelligence and spirit in the Doctrine and Covenants? They're synonymous in the Doctrine and Covenants. Right. But not, so, in not in later Latter-day Saint theology. Right, right. In the development of B.H. Roberts' theology and sort of building on Brigham Young and others, th there was like a negotiated... Uh, there was th attempts to understand. Well, th there was a kind of convergence of views Yeah, there were rejected attempts to systematize our theology, which were constantly rejected. Yeah, and, and yeah, that, take, we, take this as a good faith we expression. Have, we can't have a systematic theology in that way. Well, I mean, if I wanted to f take this for what it's worth, in order to faithfully and accurately... And f which hold you're on, not doing. Hold on. In order to accurately represent Latter-day Saint thought, you're not. 
my best effort to do that would be to talk about the different historic LDS views. It's not though, that's the problem is that what you're doing is you are saying this is somebody and this is somebody and this is somebody. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. But that is not how Latter-day Saints understand it. That, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, I've talked to some Mormons and they think this, and I've talked to some Mormons and they think that. No, I, and no, it, I've it, read this scholar who's written this paper on this, and I've read this, and if also it was, this. If it was only that, you'd be right to critique. But what I'm saying is that we should take Latter-day Saint history, Latter-day Saint teachings from LDS authorities. I, I think we should take the whole package I know, but and try to accurately represent Latter-day Saint thinking. But that's not consistent Saint with our thinking. theology or understanding or our practices or how we work. Do you believe there's a Heavenly Mother? I do, yeah. Is that in your canon? No. Okay, do you restrict official doctrine to what's in the canon? I don't believe that's official doctrine. Right, so, okay, there's, there's a really great example here. Uh, if someone asked me, hey, Aaron, I just moved here to Utah, do Latter-day Saints believe in a Heavenly Mother? If I said yes, would that be fair? I, I wouldn't care if you said yes or not. Okay, but if somebody said, hey, Aaron, don't say yes but because it's not you, official why doctrine. Why would you say we believe that? Because of the sum total observation of how... Hold yeah, but how would you understand that? Why, why would we believe in a heavenly mother? Because of the whole system? Now, what, what, is the, what is the basis for believing that there would be a heavenly mother? Because of a combination of what Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and subsequent what, what prophets taught. What is the doctrine? Taught. What is the theological underpinning of believing that there is a divine feminine? Can I give you a 15 second answer without wanting one, why, why one liners? That? Is that like a tactic or something? No, it just seems like you cut off too early. I, well, because, well, I, I want you to be able to give no, so here's what you do. full thoughts, too. You start off with something that's like nonsensical, and then you build on it. But I have to stop you there, because I can't let you build on something that makes no sense. I, I genuinely think it would be more respectful. And if I've done, if I've, like, if I've violated this to you, I'm sorry. I'm but not I, concerned I, with that. Though. I genuinely think Fortunately. it'd be more respectful if you let me complete a thought. That's fine. Go ahead and complete your thought. I, if, I, if I wanted, if thought. it was a ev fellow evangelical saying, why would you say Latter-day Saints believe in Heavenly Mother? I would say, well, it started with the, la the latest Teachings Why wouldn't you just direct them to an LDS source? Who well, let me let me complete let, let me complete the answer. I would say, well, it started with Joseph Smith, his his uh, later teachings, such as found in the King Fault Discourse, and the way that theology developed with Brigham Young and subsequent prophets, has sort of led to a more or less standard LDS theology that you'll find in their public statements. And one of the best ways you could kind of get a quick summary of LDS teaching today is to read a manual that they use internally. It's been published multiple times, republished. It's called Gospel Principles. And you know what the better way to do it? And hold on. And in Gospel Principles, they explicitly affirm Heavenly Mother. And even though you can't find it in its canon, even though that some Latter-day Saints say it's not official, it's fair and accurate to say Latter-day Saints believe in Heavenly Mother. But why is that? You haven't articulated the reason. Why, what, sir? Again, that's my problem. You guys don't... Why is that? I, mean, I didn't hear, I know your question. Why would we believe that there's a divine feminine? Because of your greater worldview and how the, dot, the dots connect. Because of a gendered view of the gods, a gendered view, I think some Latter-day Saints would even say a gendered view of the intelligences. Right, we don't believe in a distinction between God and humans in kind. Um, that's true, but right. that's not official and doctrine. That, no, no, that's actually what we, we believe. We don't believe that's that not a distinction ex, between... That's not explicated in your, in, your, in your canon. By the strictest LDS standards of officiality, what you just said is not necessarily true. It's in Genesis. That God and man are of the same species. Yeah. So not every, not every Latter-day Saint agrees. Right, yeah, no. It's not necessarily Find official. me a Latter-day Saint that doesn't and tell them to call me because I would love to find one. Yeah. I've, been, I've been a member for a very long time. I've never met one that didn't. Okay. So uh, explain to me how, that, how they work that out. Well, in this view, it, it starts to sound a little bit more like Osler, but in this view, God has always been God. He's and do you do this with your own theology? Do you say in this view, in this view, in this view? Well, I have to, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, like... Um, do you explain that, that, like, we believe in a doctrine called Sola Scriptura that can't be coherently found in the biblical text, and we believe in a doctrine of a trinity that's also not articulated anywhere in the biblical text. Do you do that? We have... We have um, that's maybe him, Dad. Let me, let me, or do you engage in the presuppositional type discussion that you've been doing? There's three sources I try to draw from that help me converge on doctrine, right? One, uh, scripture, mm -hmm. and that is to be the most authoritative and final Which word. Would be your interpretation of scripture, not, not scripture. My, my aim is to have as high of a view of scripture as Jesus did. The second and a subordinate source that's so not the same level of scripture would be Christian history. And what I mean by that is when I read scripture, I want uh, trusted Christian authors throughout Christian history, essentially be on my shoulder. I want to read in community with other Christians. So there's historical theology, 
there's, there's an interpretation of the scriptural text, and there's called, what's called systematics, and that's just reflecting on how the ideas of scripture come together, right? So I, what I would say is that in Latter-day Saint, or what I would encourage my Latter-day Saint friends to do is when you're thinking about your own theology is to try to do all three. What does the original text mean? What have our uh, leaders taught over the history? Uh, there's different attempts to do this by Terrell Givens or um, Charles Harrell where they talk about the development of different ideas within the LDS history. And then there's attempts at doing systematics, just connecting the big ideas and how the big ideas are mutually reinforcing. I'm, this isn't even a criticism, I'm just saying for Latter-day Saints to mature in their theology, just as Protestants mature in their theology, every single one of those, all three of those, they matter. And so I, I would want Latter-day Saints not, to, I would want Latter-day Saints to be extremely clear about a historical development of what your own leaders have taught. So is Adam God a part of the, is Adam God a part of that story? Yes. Does that necessitate that y'all yeah. believe in Adam God today? No. no. Are there different views of spirit birth and premortality and the Holy Ghost and Heavenly Grandfather and no Heavenly Grandfather? Yeah, there's different LDS attitudes on that. But for me to accurately represent Latter-day Saint theology and thinking. Which wouldn't be your responsibility. It would be to articulate your theology in an attempt to try to convert and to help somebody to understand what they're supposed to be replacing what they believed with, which you don't do. I would want Latter-day Saints to understand their own theology yeah, so well what enough, happens is, but I would want you to understand here's Christian the end, Here's the end result. So what happens is, is, for example, if an LDS person leaves and joins your church, right, mm -hmm. they don't know anything. So what, what they mean? start doing is they start merging LDS ideas that make sense into Protestant ideas that don't. Initially. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think they don't make sense. No, but, and they continue to do that. Well, I mean, when someone, when someone becomes an evangelical from a Latter-day Saint background, there's years of, of sort of, um, Paul says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Right. They have to be convinced you, you of certain you learn to re, We learn to rethink things. Yeah, they have, to, they have to be convinced of the presuppositions that are required in order to reach the conclusion that they're supposed to reach. Right. Okay, well, I mean. So for example, the Bible is God's word, and then they're like, well, that's what Latter-day Saints believe is the Bible is God's word. But here's what that means from a Protestant perspective. Sure, yeah. It means it's the sole, exclusive, infallible rule of faith. And that God himself... Wrote it. He inspired the very words. Right, yeah, he wrote it. He wrote it in the sense of superintending all the words to be yeah, exactly he what he wanted yeah. them to be. Except that they are written in Hebrew and Greek, and we don't have those texts. We have a sufficiently reconstructed right. according to, text of the original. According to the opinions of various scholars. According even to some so Latter-day Saints scholars. actually, your framework is this. This is what's interesting about your framework as you described it. Give me the three steps of your framework again. So there's um, the authoritative text of Scripture. Okay, which would require somebody to be well-versed in linguistics of Hebrew and Greek, and also to be able to understand and articulate the context into which those texts were written which would require attending an academic setting and to be instructed sufficiently so that they understood how ancient Israelites viewed their surrounding paradigm. Then okay. you would have to go into the second century and understand what the Greek pagan Roman perspective was with respect to how Paul interacted and engaged with them. Then you'd have to understand Greek. And after you've done that, then what? Well, hold on. I, 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 I do think that's a... I think a person... Surely you're not telling somebody that they can pick up a King James Bible and just read it and understand it. Okay, I've got to give you a 15-second answer on that one. With respect to the things necessary... For, no, no, no. no I, you, I want to answer this. Though. Again, I want you to, get no, to decide I, I, I actually really want to answer what's that. necessary. Well, I want to answer this. With respect to the things necessary to believe for salvation, yes, a person can... With, uh, just with, pull open the Bible and just believe it. They can take a... Uh, a Even if they have a wrong view of Jesus. They can take a, a Bible written in the vernacular right. of, of their common speech, and they can read it and get to know the person of Jesus. At the end of John, it says, these things are written so that you may have yeah. eternal life. Again, that's presupposing you understood what John meant, which is not what he meant. The I, Bible tells us what, what I we would, should really I would, for um, life. So I would say one of the most beautiful things about the Protestant Reformation was that it had an optimism that if the Bible was translated into the vernacular and people would read it, there was a plain, sufficiently plain meaning, at least with respect to the things necessary to believe for salvation, that is accessible to the common it's person. It's not though. It's not though. It can't be. Linguistically, culturally, historically, it cannot be accessible to them. It can't be. A, a, honest question They would for you. have to understand the, the cultural and semantic context into which those texts were written to the people they were written. 
honest question for you. At the end of John, it says, like I said earlier, Again. these things are written so that you may have eternal life, that you may believe in the Son of God. And right. By believing in his name, you have eternal life. That you may have eternal life. What, so why, I mean, honest so question. So why do we need anything but John? Well, I would say that if all you had was John and you were in the prison, if you were in a prison cell and you read the Gospel of John, you could become a Christian. You could know Jesus. I would agree with life. that. Absolutely. They're not experts, though. They don't know. Yeah, okay, Greek. but that does, they, that's they, not they, your threefold thing. So again, they well, have to wait. Again, yeah, sorry. You you have the Gospel of John. Let's let's limit it to that. I have the Gospel of John, and I read it, and I understand it, and that is sufficient for me to be saved. And there's been so many people who have done just that. They've read the Gospel of John and become believers. Okay, yeah, and that, believers in what? In the Jesus of the Bible, and they've had their sins okay, forgiven. but they don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. They believe in the Jesus of John. The Jesus of John is the Jesus of the Bible. I, it's the Jesus that's presented by the author of John. That kind so, of, this like kind if of... I don't know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? What does that mean? Well, Honest With answer. Just the Gospel of John. Honest answer. If you just keep reading John, you get a better idea of what. Yeah, that and means. if you read John chapter 14, it doesn't mean that they are homo uses. right? I, I'm, you'd have to flesh that out. Yeah. So, so. I don't think John 14 negates. There's no, there's no Trinitarian theology in John. I so if I don't believe in a Trinitarian theology, let's say that I don't. I don't know anything about Trinitarian theology. What I read is a father with a son, a mm. father who is speaking to a son in prayer. In supplication, yeah. a father who raises his son in glory yeah. to sit at his right hand. Absolutely. Okay, Amen. and then I walk away and I think, co-substantial homo eusis. I don't think. No, um, to, you wouldn't. To be clear, I don't think believers in the Trinity originally had precise theological language they for the Trinity. They didn't understand it the way the Protestants believe is required in order for us to have the same Jesus. Do you think so? That, do you believe that understanding the nature of Jesus specifically is required for salvation? Not with precision. Okay, so I can believe that Jesus is simply a guy that was sent by God, the Word, made flesh, whatever that means, and that he came in and he did some stuff and he taught some stuff, he died on a cross and he was resurrected. And I, I believe that, I'm I, good. I preached a sermon on this question, um, I think three weeks ago, I forget how long ago. Um, and the way I described it was that when most believers start out, they just start out believing that there is one God and Jesus is God. So it's not natural at all. It's not, it, it, it's virtually impossible to find. I'm not talking about most believers. Hold on, it's virtually, I, I don't think you could find a genuine believer who would say that Jesus was like you said, just a guy. I, I think that when when you discover the resurrected Jesus, never heard of Unitarians? when a saved genuine believer, so Unitarians aren't saved genuine believers. I, I don't think Unitarians are saved. No, I. I but when it, when someone Why genuinely when someone genuinely comes to know Jesus, they immediately have the impulse to worship him. They bow down and worship Jesus. Except he said to worship his father. What did they do after the resurrection? They worship him. What do they do in Revelation 5 right, right, right. Again, with the Lamb of so God standing about, as though slain? You're talking about after he had been exalted. He was worshipped. Made God. Yeah. He wasn't made God. Again, those, again no. that's presupposing. I'm just talking about John. Sure. I mean, in John, Jesus is worshipped. Okay. So I'm, what I'm saying is that if, and, you, if, and, if you were to take me to someone and they... And they understand and they, now that Jesus is a separate God or the same God as his Father? Or in what context is he God? Because I just have John. Yeah, there's one God in John. Okay. I don't think a genuine believer is going to say that there's again, many gods again, you, you in that the, sense. Again, that's your, that's your catch-all statement. A genuine believer, a genuine Israelite, a genuine this. They believe what I do. You don't see how self-defeating that is? But not the same ideas. Yeah, and so the problem with that is, is that you're not articulating that a theological position that is overriding and systematic that everybody must believe in order to be saved because that's what you're advocating you're advocating if somebody doesn't have a systematic understanding of theology no that's not that what i'm saying i'm not saying that no i, I think that's a then misunderstanding why do you tell us we have a different jesus because you teach a different jesus like in what way because he did not organize all the things organized what does that mean? i don't actually don't know if you personally believe that what does that mean that jesus didn't create all things created he didn't even organize everything. Organized. Yeah, creator ex nihilo is not a biblical concept. So. so Jesus is not responsible for the creation of everything created. 
even if you even if you even if you limit that to organization in the classic Latter-day Saint framework he didn't even organize everything organized he didn't because of other worlds under other gods and other generations of the gods where does it say that in LDS theology in the King Fault discourse again, Sermon in the again, Grove again. The in church the has classic been very Latter-day Saint that that is not our doctrine. We don't have enough authoritative sources to make that our doctrine. What you're what you're doing That's is your distinction. It's your pharisaical to fall back in the idea of officiality. No, it's not. Absolutely. Yeah, because your prophets are responsible for more than just officiality. So who can I go to as the authoritative source of Protestant theology? The Bible. No. Who, who can we go to for the authority, okay. authoritative source of LDS theology? The Bible. That's not even true by your own standards. It is. It is true. The Bible. No, earlier in this discussion, you talked about how it's... No, no, no. ...doesn't have a... You're, you're mistaking the frameworks. From your framework, that's your framework, not mine. Your framework requires objectivity, with because that's what we're claiming. So, for example, again, we can systematically study the Bible. What was the second component of the three? When I mention those three categories, that's for that's one? for responsible... No, what's the second ...maturing yeah, what's theology. The second one? It's... The authoritative, authoritative yeah, text of scripture, uh, interpreted in community with the historic church, uh -huh. so systemizing the big ideas. Okay, systematizing. Okay, so who systematizes? Which y'all should do too. Which y'all should attempt to do the same Who's, thing. Who systematizes authoritatively in the Protestant faith? The church. Who's the church? Uh, the collection of believers. Okay, so they all just get together and decide. Uh, it's not by pronouncement. There's no fiat. There's no fiat. It's, it's not, not by, by pronouncement. Revelation. It's there is a what's called a subordinate authority. Yeah. Uh, given to the church by the Holy Spirit to reflect upon exactly. Scripture. Because you know what's missing in those three? God. He's in all three. No, he's not. Yeah, he, is. he can't be. He interprets the, the text of Scripture infallibly. Your, your he, he, hold on, I'll finish it. He, he gave the church the Holy Spirit. How? Oh. Uh, he sent the Holy Spirit and gave the gift of the Holy Spirit in every believer. So that the church is the, is the pillar and foundation of truth. It's it's uh, it's moved by the Holy Spirit. It's protected by the Holy Spirit. So every Protestant's right. Hold on. It's the church is shepherded by King Jesus. God's involved in that. And then there's the systematizing, systemizing, where believers are reflecting upon Scripture with the Holy Spirit in community, going back to Scripture because Scripture interprets Scripture, using the guardrails of Scripture, using the authority of Scripture. The New Testament. You don't think believers have the authority to try to connect the dots of Scripture? No. No, they don't. Did Paul say, all of you believers have the authority to connect the dots? Can I give you a real... Did Paul say that? Wait. Wait, did he say that? I say that, Wade? I think Acts 1711 is a good scripture for did, did, did Paul tell his congregations that they had the authority to just figure it out? Jesus held people accountable for doing that. Jesus wasn't there. Did hold on, Paul hold on. tell his congregations that they had the authority to figure it out? Paul said all scripture is God breathed no, Paul, and profitable for reproof, for righteousness, for training, for rebuke. Yeah, and Paul, Jesus, Jesus held people accountable for putting scripture together and making some total right. evaluations on the all big scripture ideas. scripture is profitable. But, but, but Jesus held people accountable to things that were not explicated. Did Paul offload the responsibility? How's it going? I am. How's it going, man? So. Did Paul give the authority to interpret the scripture to his, to his believers? Paul didn't give authority to anybody. So did Paul have authority to do it? As a believer, to start with, so and, just as a and, believer, and as an no, apostle. He had no and as an apostle. Okay, so as an apostle, yeah. he had authority specifically and uniquely to declare the word of God to his congregations? Yes. Or just whenever they didn't want to do it themselves? I'm not saying that the interpretations that systemize scripture are to be pronounced as scripture as though... I know you don't because you can't. Okay, you well... In closed do, do you think that Latter-day Saints have any sort of authority to think about and reflect on and piece together the big ideas of what your own prophets teach? Yes, but they can't believe distinct and different from the church. The church meaning the collective witness of the church? No, believing the, the apostles. The apostles pronounce doctrine. How? In a variety of ways. So I asked you earlier, and you, you affirmed that the, that the LDS prophets have taught a consistent view of God. No, no, you, you're, you're, you're misstating what I said. What did, what did you say? So what I said is, what is, we, 
what is the actual authoritative way in which the church affirms official declarations and doctrine? No, I straight up asked you, hey, what, does what the Bible is, portray no, no, no. a consistent view of God? You said no. a question that's not relevant to the actual thing that we did. I straight up asked you. Right, you asked me a question to try to say, is every prophet, first of all, they're not prophets, they're apostles. Do right. your prophets and apostles portray apostles. a consistent view of who God is? They're apostles. They're an apostolic body. So if, if in the first century the apostles disagreed with one another, how did they resolve that? Disagreed at what level? If they disagreed on anything. When Peter was not acting in step with the gospel. When Peter was not acting in step with the gospel, Paul rebuked him. Uh-huh. And then Peter repented, okay. just as we can tell. Right. Okay. So Peter repented at okay. Paul's... So I, I, Paul was authoritative over Peter? I'd like to speak to you in a personal way right now. Do you think religion's a game? Yes, largely. Because you act like it's a kind of debate, sparring no, what I think kind it of is. activity. This is what I think it is. Religion. Like this, this is religion, boxing for you. No, no, no. Religion is trying to look at, well, do you think that there's an objective morality? Yeah. Do you think the Bible's objectively moral? It, yeah. it declares that morality. Yeah, I would define do that certainly. Do you believe way, that yeah. the Bible is clear to anybody who reads it? On the basics. Again, you, you, you have to... It is not equally case. clear on all things. Again, right. There's a whole bunch of questions it just doesn't answer. It doesn't even sure. address or touch. Yeah. Right? But do you believe the Bible says the 66 texts of the Bible alone are God's word? Not explicitly. It doesn't say that anywhere at all. And if it doesn't say it explicitly, how could somebody walk away and say, that's what it says? Because of the very nature of the text. No, no, no. The nature of the text is that you have texts that were written across time, largely by unknown authors, to specific audiences for why is, specific Why is that a problem, purpose. by the way? It's that, a problem. Why is it a problem for the... No, that's a really great point. Protestants believe in certain books of the Bible which are not given an explicit author, a human author. Right. Right? Okay. Why, is that a, why is that such a big problem in Latter-day Saint theology? Or for you, at least. Well, they're apostolic, right? Not every book's written explicitly by an apostle. Okay, right. N not everyone need be written explicitly by so a known character. Why is Hebrews authoritative? Uh, because of its very nature. Okay, right. So, right, you made a, you made as, an, you as, made a subjective de decision about what it contained. The church... And decided... No, not the church. The church by the Holy Spirit, not by pronouncement. Again, again. Recognizes the book of Hebrews the, as the scripture. The church by the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit directed a thing to occur, and that is not a revelatory and authoritative act that is recorded. That's why Latter-day Saints have a hard Say time again. with Protestantism. I, so I didn't process The Holy it, Spirit said it when? He spoke, he spoke Hebrews. That's the very Where, nature of scripture. Right, I understand that. You think that. He's saying the formation of the canon or the recognition No, what I'm of saying the canon is, is that objectively wasn't, uh, wasn't put in scripture you guys, itself. You guys yeah. argue objectivity all the time. It's a it's a mistake. Scripture is scripture day one. Faith, scripture did not scripture does not become scripture later. That's a theological position. Okay. That's a theological position. You have to understand that, that is a that is a that is a position you hold that is not an objective fact. Okay. You can't you can't live in a world of this is objective and this is subjective. Can God because speak with clarity? Is, is religion, is religion. Hold on, hold on, no? No. Can God speak words that are translatable, transmissible, and, and, and teachable that are clear? Can he actually speak a word from the sky that everybody hears and understands the same way? Does God have the omnipotent power to inspire words which are sufficiently clear to his audience for accountability and teaching? Yes, but not through an apostle or a prophet or writings or scripture. Why not? What kind of low God do you have? What kind of weak God do you have? I don't have a God that interferes with my own free will and agency. Okay, okay. Because you guys don't believe in that. You guys don't believe in libertarian free will. Uh, most Christians do. Most Christians that believe in inerrancy believe in libertarian but you don't. free will. Not in the same way. I, I, no, I would say that whatever you hold free will to be, call it libertarian, whatever you want, whatever it is concurs with the will of God. But but even people who are not Calvinistic, who are classic Arminians or Wesleyans, people who are Molinists, hold to, usually hold to, the dual author of God scripture. can make people do stuff. That God can God write, can make people that God can inspire infallible can, and inerrant words. God can write, and that's absurd. Okay, so you because, know what? Because how does he do it? This, this, this idea that God can't inspire how infallible words. How does he do it? He superintends. How does he do it? He superintends the, no, the no, no. authoring he, process. No. He, he worked through human beings 
Yeah. Who he spoke to in what way, specifically? You're, at, you're asking me to peer into mystery. Yeah, that, right. That's what I'm saying. Right. You're, you're already articulating mystery. You sure. are saying mystery. And the yeah. way you're saying it is you're saying that I know that these texts were effectively authored by God. And they, we have them as yeah. his will. Yeah. And they are perfect. So let me make an observation. I think your view of who God is affects your view of no, what... No, it doesn't. It doesn't. My view of what scripture is affects fin my view of what Finishing the thought. I think this is really important for the audience. That I think they'll pick up here and in the you're conversation. you're going to misrepresent what I'm saying? I hope Is it really not. important for the audience for you to misrepresent and mischaracterize I don't want to misrepresent you. You are. That's what you're doing. I'm telling you right now that's what you're doing. You should stop. Well, what I'm saying is that the nature okay, go of God... Go ahead and anyway, I guess. The nature of God right. connects to one's view of the, of the inspiration of scripture. Yeah. Who you, got, who you view God to be influences how you think inspiration I can be done. I don't view God as a tyrant. That's right. So, so you're, you're connecting those dots, but you're connecting them differently, right? No, I don't believe God is a tyrant. That's okay. right. I believe that he speaks to humans who are willing to hear him. Because of what you believe God is and can does. Can God speak to everybody and make them all believers? I'm not mad at you. I'm not trying no, to no, talk I'm not over you. Right? Okay. No, but uh, what you're doing is you're just right. It seems like, conceptually, you think that because of who God is and what he would do, have certain implications in the very near to be of inspiration. No, no. So I'm, I'm just not, saying. I'm not doing that. You have a coherence you are removing, to those views. That's you right. are removing reality from your theology. I'm not you're, sure our microphones function with right. that kind of thing. You're removing reality from your theology. Can you do what you want? I'd have to qualify that big time. Can you do what you want? I can't jump to the in moon. In any context, can you do what you want? I can't jump to the moon. I can't turn myself into a different species. I, I'm not sure what you mean. I, I, I don't, I did not mean to be controversial or to No, within be, the realm of reality, obviously. Can you, you go fly to the sun? I can do, I can do things. Can you do what you want? I can do things that. In a real world that exists here in reality. I think I can do things that are according to the nature God gave me and according to the circumstances he gave me, according to the moral nature that I currently have. So I need to be, I need to be put in a position to have a certain nature, to have a certain kind of heart to act on my uh, heart, act of the will to do certain things. You can't do what you want. There's certain things I God, want to do. You can do what God do. wants you to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can do what God wants yeah, me to I do. But I don't even think that Travis, plays out in reality. Travis, I just want to make another personal note here. I don't think your pugnacious way of interacting with me represents the best of Latter-day Saint culture. I don't really care. Well, I, I would I would want to say to the audience that I would not want to project your behavior on the rest of because and I Latter wouldn't Saints. want to project your behavior on the rest of Protestants. That's either. that's fine, but because the, most Protestants, the the Latter Day Saints we interact with on the street, I would say vast majority are polite. Vast. I've been polite. The, the the vast majority of Latter Day Saints we talk to are respectful. You don't think I'm polite and respectful? No, at all. I don't. I don't. I, Why I think, am I not polite and respectful? I think you're pugnacious in a way that's rude. Oh. I, and I've been I've been pugnacious in my life in a way that's rude, and I've had to repent of that. But I'm just saying the way you've interacted with me is I think pugnacious in a way again, that's not that doesn't represent the best of Latter Day so Saint culture. Rather than focus on my attitude and my approach, it was worth a, it was worth a mention. Right, it's not worth mentioning. I, I think it is. is. That, yeah. What it sounds like is it sounds like I'm. I, I, it sounds like you're losing an argument, which we're not having an argument. I mean, but I, that's what it sounds like. I would it's rather. Like he's he's aggressive and abrasive, and I don't like it. And, Hey, audience, Travis is aggressive and aggr ab abrasive and aggressive. That's just... I think your your conduct on life, online has been abusive to other believers. And you can you can think whatever you want. I think your conduct and his conduct and his conduct is abusive and abrasive to members who are walking around who you attack with deep theological problems that they have not considered. And you don't articulate them or contextualize them because you don't understand them yourselves. Like Andrew said, I don't know what the LDS position is on it, but I'm here to tell you it's wrong. I don't know what the LDS position on that. I actually have it recorded that you did. I, I don't. And I'll, I'll attach it as a no, link I, to this video. I, so, 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 I, so, he, so the problem with it is, is that you guys are out here to do what exactly? Travis, I think the, with the question of whether God the Father ever was a sinful mortal, or with the, the question of whether it matters he was a sinful mortal, it doesn't take intellectual sophistication, it just takes humility. It does, no, it takes intellectual sophistication within the framework of LDS thought, which you don't articulate to people. You're trying to play gotcha. I think, You're trying to, it's like. It's I think like, it's the least gotcha question you could think so of. So for example, for example. It's, it's the for example, least sophisticated example, question you could the, think of. What's the, what's the. Was what's God the, ever wait, a sinner? Was wait, he ever perhaps a what's sinner? The statistic, could he have a what's sinned? the statistic of members that you talk to who leave the church? I don't know. Do they become evangelicals? 
I don't know are they of, of people we talk to. No, no, just of people who leave as a consequence of 10, whatever you bring 20%, up. Twenty percent. I don't know the, the statistics. Yeah, it's, it's probably, about twenty percent. Yeah, most Actually, of them. Most of them. And most of those kind of die off. Most of them continue in a tradition of cynicism toward the Bible. Right. Yeah. Because you guys articulate a worldview that is far removed from reality. And, and you don't see it. You can't see it. You're, you're so narrow in your perspectives. It's why, it's why Wade here blocked me. So we were having yeah. a discussion about Sola Scriptura. These, these big Christian ideas. And he recognized that the idea itself can't be articulated by anything other than feelings. Right? No, I, I don't trust. I, believe, I don't trust the way you recount my brothers. I believe. But I believe. I, know what you're talking about. I believe the yeah. Bible is the word of God because feelings. And if you go far enough, eventually that's what they have to concede. The, so, for example, why do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Well, I'm going to I'm going to bring it back to this: the idea that God the Father never sinned, and the idea that it's important that He never sinned. That's not something that requires my my young, I don't believe my it, young so. daughter doesn't require sophistication to come to a good conclusion about that. She would if there's a if there is a robust theological framework for believing that. I, I actually think that I did a lot of evangelism in the streets of Manti, and I talked to a lot of young teenagers who had yet been on their mission. And what I what I observed is that these Latter Day Saint teenagers pre-mission teenagers were very eager to say there was only one, that God had always been God and that he never was a sinner and that it was absolutely absurd to think that he ever could have sinned. And then sinned. you corrected them. And then, it, then when they come back from their mission and they mature after a few years, they are corrupted by their own culture, by their own teachings to start saying, well, maybe Heavenly Father was perhaps a sinful mortal or he wasn't, but it doesn't matter matter what whether he was. It, it goes in the reverse direction. For, for, for Latter, even for Latter-day Saint children, they know intuitively with a monotheistic impulse that it's abs that it's really it's not humble it's arrogant it's wrong it's absurd What's to believe arrogant? to believe that heavenly father could have sinned or that it doesn't matter whether he sinned why? to have a, to have a god that needed to receive forgiveness from you another god that. there's plenty of latter day again, saints who believe again, he could have been a that, sinner there's there's plenty of protestants who believe all kinds of nonsense there's not a single latter day there's not a single protestant who believes heavenly father was once there's perhaps a sinful mortal there's not a single mortal. protestant who believes in the atonement or its efficacious nature to exalt human beings to become like God and reach a full potential. Do you think you could? So when you when you die and you're saved and you're with God, what happens? I go to heaven. And then what? I'm resurrected. Why? Because I trusted in Jesus. What's the purpose of life? To honor God okay. and to know Him and to love Him and have a relationship. So why with him. did the incomprehensible triune God create human beings in a state of sinful depravity? They were for, not created for, in a state of sinful depravity. You were. No, I don't. Were, I, I were you depraved that. from your birth? Can, can you slow down? Okay. I, do you genuinely care about what Protestants believe? Yes. Okay, so piece of advice: uh, go to the Westminster Confession, or or go to yeah. another like a like a London Baptist Confession. No, again, read a historic Christian again, Protestant right, confession. Again, you're doing just get a Aaron, get a good summary of you're doing the exactly Christian. what you're saying that I'm doing, and you're you're. There's you're, no Christian confession listen, that listen, teaches that we're again. You're now saying it's not what the Christian believes, it's what these things say, which is exactly what you are saying I can't do with my own theological framework. So There's, here's the issue. No, I'm no, no, asking no, no. you no, I'm gonna rewind. You're, you're bouncing around. I'm asking you specifically. We do not teach that Jesus, that God created humans sinful. Yes, you do. Okay, you can, you can think fact, that. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I answer my question. When you were born, were you born in a state of sinful depravity? Yes, but that okay, does not right. mean I was created as a sinner. Right. You were created as a sinner. No, I would not say I was Did created as a sinner. Did you exist before you were born? No. Okay, so you were created in sin. I was I was created to represent no, Adam. No, no, no. Now you're or, saying Adam is the representative head, and as a result of Adam's sin, which he didn't sin, by the way, if you'll read Genesis. If you'll actually read the text, he couldn't have sinned. He was cursed. He was cursed? Mm -hmm. and, and that means he He sinned? was expelled from the garden. So? And then that began that began a um, downward spiral. The, the book of Genesis, rebellion against God's word. What, what, did, what, did, what sin? Uh, opposing God's commands. How did you do that? By eating of the forbidden fruit and the no, New Testament. eating of the fruit the and new the knowledge of good and evil. The New Testament. Can a person sin without the knowledge of good and evil? I'm going I'm to complete that thought. The New Testament says not to uh, imitate Eve. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. And in Romans chapter 5, th this is beautiful. The one transgression of Adam is contrasted with the one act of righteousness of Jesus Christ in Romans 5. So in Paul's framework, uh -huh. celebrating the 
work of Jesus on the cross and his one act of righteousness is all the more displayed as glorious when contrasted with the sin of Adam, which bro which led to the depravity of humanity. But he calls transgression, right? Yeah. What's a transgression? It's a sin. So. See, that's what I'm saying. You guys, you, you we're see, not, Travis, we're like, not your enemy. I, no, 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 you're I, not, I, you're I, not our I enemy. Think, but you're talking to me like we're your sparring opponents, we're your enemies. No, 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 we, that's how you're perceiving it. Because the problem yeah, with it is, yeah, is that, I am, because no, 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 no. you're, 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 what you're not understanding. You're sparring with me as though I'm your enemy. No, no, what you're not understanding is, is that, for example, you don't read these texts very carefully. You just say, Adam sinned. Show me in Genesis what the sin is. He took the forbidden fruit. Okay, how is that a sin? He was commanded not to. What's the to. definition of sin? To do what, God, to uh, disobey God's commands. Okay, so disobedience is sin. Yeah. To contradict his okay. character and to so contradict his commands. So irrespective of knowledge of any kind of act, you are guilty of a sin, irrespective of whether you understood the actual command associated with it, or he was, he was given the reasons or means. Yeah, yeah, he, okay. Adam was given specific commands. Except he didn't commands. have the knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean to you? He didn't I mean, have the knowledge of good and evil. He, he knew enough to know he should not no, eat No, 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 that's fruit. your inference. That's your, that's your imposing that on the biblical text. So, so Adam, the biblical or, text Travis, specifically sorry, articulate yeah. that the tree possessed the knowledge of good and evil. If a person can sin without any comprehension or understanding of good and evil, how does that make sense? I'm happy to talk about it um, if you want to hear an answer. Sure. I think that the idiom of the knowledge of good and evil it's what the text says. So in the rest of the Old Testament, the idiom of the knowledge of good and evil uh, seems to refer... It doesn't actually mean good and evil. Okay, well, if you don't want to hear me explain it. I'm just it, saying... It, it, it's it, starting to be pearls before swine. 